Thanks a lot for watching all our courses as part of Tacademy. Now, welcome to the new course on the software development process and its methodologies. Now, before we start, have you ever really thought about why we need to learn about software development process and its methodologies? Well, let me make you understand in a very easy way. Now, with all the new technologies that are out there, software engineering is one of the most complex things that has actually been created, which includes all kinds of engineering. Now, for instance, say when we look at civil engineering, it's kind of difficult to figure out. Now, imagine you're building a flat in your city. Well, it's definitely a huge task. Now, in the middle, what if you find a crack in the concrete? The engineers would identify and fix it right away. Now, when it comes to software, it is non-physical. Here, we cannot see the mistakes, especially at the grand scale. It's hard to see for sure that it is not working right. Now, well, anything we do to help us see that if it's working fine could actually be false itself. Now, if the program logic and the test cases are wrong, we cannot figure out the problem. Now, this makes the following engineering process really crucial. Now, we have a lot of what we call codified common sense. Now, it does make sense in general, although we know that something has to be carried out, especially while dealing with a huge project. Now, we sometimes could still miss out on things, not due to any sheer negligence, but just because it's possibly impossible to keep everything in our cognitive model when dealing with something really complex. So it's very imperative to learn about the process and then adhere to it. Now, this basically is going to give us the roadmap to success. We may not follow any of the software development life cycles as we present them. Now, as a software engineer, all you need to do is to take these templates, these plans, these processes, and make engineering decisions necessary to adapt them to your needs or to your project's constraints, whichever comes first. Now, next up, let's look at the numbers that we have for the following projects. Now, again, before we actually jump into the numbers, let's look at the reports. We have an IT research firm called Standish Group of Chaos, where they release their report every year. Now, in 2015, they reported that about $81 billion were wasted in canceled projects. Now, they have another stat which pertains to 2015 again, where 19% of the projects that were commissioned actually failed. Now, this means that either the project was canceled before it could finish or project was finished, but people did not actually find any use of it. So it was discarded. So one in every five project won't actually make it through to the final submission round. Now, to understand more in detail, there's a website called Catalog of Catastrophe, and the link is given right here. Now, they've listed all the projects that failed in those years. Also, major failures have been addressed. Now, as per my knowledge and experience and expertise during my technology evangelism days at Adobe and Amazon, very few projects actually reach the business outcome that organizations are actually looking for. Now, billion-dollar projects have plummeted down and have failed miserably. Now, I personally have seen a lot of projects failing during the requirement or the needs analysis stage. Now, one of them didn't fail until it actually reached the customer's end. Now, we see many such instances where top companies lose out projects worth billions of dollars. So hopefully we understood the importance of learning about software process and methodologies. Well, I'm absolutely sure this will help you, your team, and your organization and the industry and tackle issues and proceed further towards success. Thanks a lot for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next one. Now, we know software is rapidly becoming an integral part of human life. Now, as we're seeing more and more automation and technical progress, just as we expect a truck or a car to work every time and simply cannot afford to unexpectedly break down or reboot unexpectedly. Now, software industry also needs to continue to learn better ways to build software if it is to become an integral part of human life. And that is the motivation for this particular course. Now, let's begin this course looking closely at the aspects of the SDLC process. Now, from waterfall to agile and beyond, which will be included in any of the models, topics such as how do we understand what the customers really want how to convey the design efficiently to our colleague, what are the best practices to deploy the solution when we are done, and what approaches we should use to test the product throughout the entire process. Now, once we learn about the core process of software development, we can learn about some of the industry and the standard methodologies, the pros and cons of each of them. Now, we will learn enough to have meaningful conversation about the software development processes in our teams. Let us also learn about traditional models of software development, such as waterfall, we model, and rational unified process. Now, later in the course, we'll talk about agile mindset in and get an overview of some of the common models for agile and lean software development. 
Now, in addition to quizzes, we will also do two peer review projects where we will use a fictional case study and we will need to identify software development models that we will recommend using and why we should actually be using them. Now, at the end of the course, we should also be able to apply a lot of core software engineering principles for any given problem at a conceptual level. And also, we will be able to compare and contrast traditional agile and lean software development methodologies at the very highest level. Now, these would include waterfall, rational, we model, incremental, spiral models, and agile mindset overview, and overview of a few agile models themselves. We will also learn how to propose a best suited methodology for a given situation. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next one. Now, in this session, we're going to learn and understand about what software development actually looks like and also what we will hear or see if we are part of a software development team. Now, let us also go through the journey that software industry took over the last several years. Now, having said that, we are going to come across a lot of new terms in this session. Now, the idea is to give the summary of what this course is going to be all about. Now, before we get into the process of software development, let's look at a process we might be familiar with, like building a new flat. Now, if we were to build a flat, we're probably going to reach a contractor and tell them about our needs, like we need three bedrooms, a master bedroom, and so on. And some options may be offered by the contractor themselves. And then we will have to do some research and come back to actually make our choice. Now, we're going to come up with exactly what we are looking for at the end of this phase. Then the contractor will go back and create a plan for the flat, and then he'll show us the floor plan, and we could make some adjustments. Now, once that's done, the contractor must make a detailed map of where the foundation will be, where the electricity will be, where the sockets will be, where the plumbing will be, and then start building the flat. Later, they're going to call the inspection people to come and actually inspect the house while they build the flat. Now, let's say the foundation is finished. Now, for example, they will get the foundation approved. They can get approved plumbing once the plumbing is done, so on and so forth. Now, once the flat is ready, he's going to call us and tell us if we like the house. Is this what we were actually expecting? And then if we approve it, we can then actually go ahead and start staying in the flat. Otherwise, you got to build it from the ground up, right? <laughs> anyway, now let's see how similar or different software development is with respect to the examples we actually discussed so far. Now, when we build a software similar to building a flat, we're looking at the requirements or we are looking at exactly what we need to build. We're going to do analysis of different options during that process, or we might do a prototype and present it to our client and just say, is this what you're looking for? But at the end of this step, we have to get exact definitions and exact dimensions of what we are looking to construct from the client. Next comes the software developers and the architects. They will design the system, architect the system and say, what are the different components they need to create and how they will work together. Now, once the design has been finished, they will start coding and start unit testing. Therefore, each of the sub teams will start building and testing its components. After all the components are ready, all these components will be put together. Integration testing or verification will be conducted and functional testing will be performed. And when the software is ready from the developer's point of view, they're going to invite the user and they're going to do a test called UAT, which is user acceptance testing. Now in which a user decides and says, yes, this is what I was looking for, or no, this is not really what I was looking for. And then once it's all completed, the software goes into production, which means the user is going to start using it. And after that, the client may ask for some changes or to fix some bugs or defects. Now that is called operation and maintenance. And it is quite similar to actually building a flat and then doing any kind of ongoing restoration or maintenance. Now, the model we have just reviewed is called a waterfall method. Here, we are moving from phase to phase, requirements, design, and then implementation. Now, when industries were starting to use this process, they ran into several issues. For instance, they find it very hard to predict the requirements a year or two or a year ahead. So it's very hard for them to actually forecast what the requirements might be. Now, as the market changes, or sometimes it's just very hard to predict what a user wants or does not want. Now, as the cycle is a year or two, the requirements may be misinterpreted by the developers or the architects. And so that misinterpretation goes undetected all the way to design, implementation, and verification. Now, similarly, the integration issues between the various components go undetected for a year while the software is actually developing. Now, as these issues came up, other waterfall variants began to evolve like a V model that focuses heavily on testing 
or the sashimi model or RUP model, which focuses mainly on overlapping different phases. Now, next up is the incremental model in which we do the requirements in one shot. But then we do the design, testing, and deployment in increment, followed by the spiral model, which is a risk-driven approach. Now, as all versions came along, and there's another thought process that was emerging in the software industry, which was called Agile. Now, Agile really isn't a model. It's basically a philosophy or a mindset. Now, there were a lot of top software industry leaders who developed the software quite successfully. They came together and articulated what we now call the Agile Manifesto and Principles. Now, as this manifesto and principles were developed, there were models such as Scrum, Kanban, and XP, which helped to promote this mindset. And so we can see that it's not just these three, but that a lot of other models have come as well. Now, the basic idea behind all these models is that we build them in short cycles instead of building this whole one-year cycle in one go. Now, we define this little, we build it, we test it, and we learn, and we keep moving on. Now, this way, we can quickly adjust to the market. And then, quickly, we learn from our users. And hence, the change becomes a standard because we may have a change after every cycle. Now, the software industry also needs to learn how to respond quickly and reliably to this change. Also, the concept of continuous integration, where a developer who builds the code is integrated with all the other components of that software as soon as he commits the code or actually has it, and as soon as he finishes the code, which is the most important part. And then, all the tests that verify if the system is running are called the automated testing mechanism. Therefore, as soon as we commit a code, the whole test will be tested to ensure that nothing else in the system is broken and this deployment is all automated. Therefore, as soon as a code is committed, it is automatically deployed, so there are no manual errors. The effort to deploy a code is also reduced. Now, a lot of other practices have evolved, not just those three. And so, in this automation, the safety net of automated testing helps developers respond to the changes quickly and confidently. This also led to the establishment of a new partnership between the developers and the operations team. Now, once you start moving towards a common goal, this actually led to something called a DevOps culture. Now, as this agile model became popular in smaller scale industry, people began to wonder, can we apply this on bigger projects? Well, so many new models evolved, like scale, agile framework, large scale scrum, and disciplined agile framework. Now, many companies are in the pipeline to take advantage of this model and are actually quite successful. But there's still the judgment out there around these models and their actual effectiveness. Now, the market switched from a one-year life cycle to a two-year cycle and further going down to a much smaller cycle. But then they wanted to study if there's actually a cheaper and a faster way to learn. Now, this eventually led to new concepts such as lean startup and design thinking, where we find the cheapest way to learn one cycle. Now, one such example is ZAPPOS or Zappos.com. They just wanted to sell shoes online. That was basically their business. Now, since it was a new concept, they didn't know if anyone would actually buy shoes online, right? So Instead of building a whole new shoe inventory infrastructure, they just created a website saying, let's see if people buy. Now, if people will buy, we will go to a store, buy the shoe, and then ship it to the customer. Kind of like the old Amazon model when they were doing books in the 70s. Now, they were successful in actually doing it, and then they began to add the infrastructure. Now, similarly, the same concept that applied in startups began to evolve and also was adopted to the enterprise model. This has also led team members or the organization to concentrate on the result and not just the output they create. Now, as all these processes and methodologies were evolving, industry also realized that process is just part of the puzzle. We need to think about some soft issues such as individual psychological safety or motivations and growth mindset and many other ideas. Now, as we can see in the last couple of years, the software industry has evolved quite a bit and it continues to get better and better and a lot more accomplished. Now, that's a lot for watching this particular lecture and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next lecture. Now, in this lecture, let us discuss about the requirements. Let us see what is a requirement and how we do the requirements or the requirements gathering. Now, someone who is trying to learn how to program will tell us that most difficult part of building a software is coding, or they actually would say testing. Now, when they have some more experience, but when we ask an expert software engineer, they're gonna tell us that getting the problem right will be the actual thing that they always look out for. That's identifying what problem you're trying to solve. Now, the problem contains a number of factors. The most complex thing that can be done is actually building the software. Now, it may be difficult to build dams, rocket ships, and nuclear reactors. However, in each of these cases, we are building something tangible where we can see it or touch it or feel it. 
but that's not really possible, right, with software. Now, fact that the software cannot be touched makes it actually much more difficult. Now, due to this property, it is very difficult to communicate exactly what we mean when we speak to other people regarding our problem. Also, it is a proposed solution as we cannot actually see it. Now, in addition to that, they might not know how to solve the problem. And also, they may not even know what they really want. Now, two different users of the same system might need two completely different things. And those things can be called by one name, which will be actually even more confusing, right? Now, in such a situation, we define a little bit of rigor in this nebulous process. We define the specification of our requirements. Now, the requirements are two different things. First, this is a process by which we create a shared understanding of the problem that exists and ultimately the needs of our supposed solution that we want to build to solve the problem. Now, the high-level descriptions of all the issues that we wanted to address through our work are created with the primary objective of developing a document that describes the details of what the system will do and what it does not do. Moreover, it's really important to capture what and not really the how. We assume to determine what the solution's behavior will be without making any early decisions that could affect our ability to design a solution. Now, the solution for the design will be decided, but not really at this stage. However, the specification of the requirement is also the result of that particular process. The specification of the requirement is the documentation that we produce from the process itself. Now, This may be an informal understanding, it may be a statement of work, or it may even be a formal software requirement specification, which is an SRS document. Now, IEEE is an international organization that has a computer society which developed an SRS template that we will post so that you can look at what a formal document actually looks like. Now, there are several factors that this requirement specification process is necessary, but engineering and economic are the most widely cited reasons, so remember that. Now, the engineering argument is pretty simple. To spend the time upfront will save time later. We make less mistakes that often has far-ranging impacts. Now, if you spend a large percentage of our timeline on the stage of planning, we will do a lot better. When we don't plan for anything, then we see our schedule and the budget actually exploding. However, with only 5% planning, we see a reduced overrun. Now, note that it's not going to be zero at any given point in time, right? Even when we spend 10 to 20% on the requirements and scope, it just brings it down to 40% of the cost overrun with a long tail that looks about 35%, but not much lower than that. We cannot estimate this kind of thing accurately at any given point in time. Now, the other requirement to spend a good time on, the requirement specifications and scoping will be more micro level. As we said it before, most of the problems come from this stage. And the more they get trapped in the product, the more expensive they are to fix when we find them. In fact, When the problems are not found until the project has been deployed, we can see that the cost of repairs is as high as a thousand times the cost. Now, if the problem has been detected at the time of the requirements analysis, it's almost an exponential increase in costs at every stage going down the line. Now, the design, coding, unit and integration testing, systems testing, and again, a thousand times more at deployment. Now, managing the process of requirement specifications is crucial to the success of any software development project. Considering that many of the issues make it in our project during this phase. So it is essential to spend the appropriate amount of time at this stage to make sure that the problem and the solution are well thought out before we begin any kind of design or development work. Now, that's all for this particular lecture. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next lecture. Now in this lecture, let us differentiate between the two ways in which we document the functionality in a specification document for software requirements. Now there are two methods to write these statements about what the system will do. It's because there are two audiences for that particular piece of information. Now the first audience will be the user or the client, depending on whether or not they're the same person. In many instances, the user is not really technical. So we shall have a very hard time to talk about what they expect the software to do. They may not know the potential of what it can do, but we still have to provide some kind of information that describes what the system is actually going to do so that the user is confident that they will end up getting what the client is paying for. And actually it does what the user or client actually wanted it to do. Now, the second audience will be the development team. We must also provide sufficient information to allow people to come up with a solution to actually make a code, right? So that they understand what the system should or should not really do. Now, here's where things tend to become a little complicated. 
We use natural language, mostly because it makes it easier for us to communicate with our users. Understanding or very little technical jargon should ideally avoid some miscommunications, but it's often not really accurate. We have to be very cautious about the language that we use while developing the statements. Now let's distinguish them a little bit so that you guys have a better idea what I'm really talking about. Now user requirements are just what a user wants to do in their language. The users may not want login, though we want them to login. For example, they want the system to be protected to only allow them to post on Facebook on their behalf. So logging in is a system specification. It is a required action of the system solution that we are developing. Now system specification is generally a more precise or constraining description of how the system meets the specification of the user. This is still what the solution is going to do, but not how it's really done. However, this is how the system meets the requirements. Now software design then takes this requirement specification and details as to how and which modules to be built will be oriented towards design and development. Now let us see how we can actually really make that happen by taking a look at this particular example. Now let us take this user requirement. We want to build a boat and sell it to the general public. We spoke to some users to find out what they need so that we can build what is required. We can tell when the user should put our boat on a rack by themselves, but how can we constrain and specify our solution to ensure that situation actually happens? Now since a generic statement that one person should be able to load a boat onto a car rack doesn't really give our design team anything to do with it. We therefore specify the solution in such a way that our specification means that we have fulfilled the requirements. Now, we've got at least a partial list of things that we've got to meet. And then when we meet these things, we have met the requirements of the user. Now, this is another region of potential error to assume whether these specifications would translate into having met the requirement. So we have to take care that these are good enough to meet the requirements. We assume that if the boat is lighter than 100 pounds and has handles, it can be loaded onto the car rack by just one person. Now, there's a small but important distinction between the requirements and the specification. And this is never really easy to distinguish them in reality. Now, real world users are very likely to give that specification level details. So not all requirements need a lot of specification level details to simplify the intent. But a lot of time, it's going to happen that it does not need that particular requirement. That's all for. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next one. Uh, in this particular video, we're going to be talking about non-functional requirements, which don't specify what the system does, but rather specifies how the system performs the behaviors. Now, there are a lot of non-functional requirements for a system. A lot of these revolve around process or quality attributes that you want to instill in a particular project. Now, process requirements can be mandating a particular case system. It can also be a computer-assisted software engineering tool, such as Microsoft Project or Jira which is a bug tracking software, or it can be the programming language the team uses or the development method itself. Now, all of these are mostly design constraint. For example, an employer creates a site license for IBM development tools and server software. In that case, the solution has to use DB2, as it is the database platform and an IBM DB2 system. Now, the contract was purchased long before the project started, and the company wouldn't spend any extra money for other database software particularly. Now, the software quality is given a lot of importance initially, security, performance, and then usability. Now, every system will need these. It can be very slow or partially unusable or insecure. Some minimum amount of each of these things are required and usually inexpensive to actually make it happen. But some of these will be judged as more important than the others, and a conflict will always be there. Now, online finance applications like online banking often prioritize security over usability. Now, if you talk about two-factor authentication that has been gaining popularity recently, it is easier to actually use. Uh, maybe not, but this is a way more secure and a much more better, and that is actually the trade-off between the two. So while defining what your system is going to do, these are the things that you actually have to focus on and actually worry about. Now, let's get a closer look at three classifications of non-functional requirements. Product, organization, and then external. Now, product requirements are non-functional and they talk about specific behavior. They're mostly in the form of protocol requirements or encryption requirements or encodings. Now, these are requirements on the product from a non-functional standpoint. 
Now, organizational requirements are the ones defined by the company. Company standards, the code style requirements of development team, the development process itself, like using Scrum, and can be defined as something like this. Finally, the external constraints are a major factor, especially in the industries that are actually regulated. Now, if the FAA says this development process has to be used or has to meet these code coverage testing metrics, that's all that you can do. It has to be done that way. And if they change, you need to change as well. Now, this is the kind of control that is being talked about being impacted by external entities. Now, it is something you would want to document early on in the process to make it easier and to keep a track. So in this entire process, the non-functional requirements are of greater importance. You need to be sure to consider them separately from functionality on every project. It is very important to do so. You need to take time and consider each individual non-functional requirement you look at. Make sure that those metrics are met and then go ahead in the process. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next session. Now let us talk about the WRSPM reference model, something we call the world machine model. All right, so it's all about getting the right things. Requirements will always be present in the problem domain. It's what the user wants us to do to solve some problems they have. It is our task to understand those requirements, capture them, and then specify what software specifications we need to constrain the solution in the solution domain. Now, what has to be done with our computer or our system to actually solve these particular problems? With respect to abstraction, a lot of layers exist between the requirements or the user's goal and the software specifications. Well, the system's goals are to meet those user goals or particular requirements. Now, to determine the requirement specifications, the WRSPM model can be used. So we can see how these are separated using WRSPM. You can see that there is an environment and there is a system. So the environment consists of all the user visible elements of everything in the world, including some part of the system where the overlaps and that overlap is what we call the interface. So our system interface is usually a user interface or a UI or a GUI, which is a graphical user interface. Now that's what interface actually means. The location of the meeting between what the users can do and the, what the system can do or display to the user on their commands to get the input and then actually give the output. So there are five different elements present in the WRSPM model. Let me get into the details of each of them. Now, W stands for the world. These are all the world assumptions, all the things that are known to be true. Now, it won't get as complex as saying that gravity works. Of course, that's a world assumption, but we are more particular about the world assumptions that have an impact on our system and on our problem domain. Now, everyone takes these things for granted and they're parts that are actually difficult to capture. Now, R stands for the requirements, the user's language, understanding of what the user wants from the solution. For example, users want to withdraw money. They will go and find an automatic teller machine to do that. Here, the ATM is the solution. Now, S stands for the specifications. The specifications are present in that interface area. Is the interface between how the system is going to meet those particular requirements. So it will be written in system language. Now, from a user or natural language perspective, so it says in natural language, let's just say simple English, what the system is actually going to do. So it could say things like uh, to withdraw money from the ATM, your card has to be inserted, then the pin number. Next, you need to select checking or savings. The amount to be withdrawn has to be entered using a numerical pad, and it has to be increments of $20 for a majority of ATMs. Now, the user doesn't care about all these factors. The user just wants to withdraw money. The specification is how they're going to do that and how the system is going to meet the requirement. Now, P stands for the program you'll see that that's outside of the environment in the system. It is all the way over the other side of the line. That program is going to be written by the software developers. The program that meets the specification to provide the user goal for the requirements. The program will have all the code, underlying frameworks, anything that is used from a software perspective. Now, finally, M stands for the machine. This is the hardware specification. It could include the roller for distributing money, the logbox to see, that one of the business requirements is that one just doesn't walk up and take all the money, right? So it's the existing hardware that's behind the system itself. So we have this world understanding, the requirements which sit inside the environment, the deal with the user requirements, the specification that defines how the two will meet, the program that meets that specification to meet the requirements, and finally the machine that all of it runs on. Now within this, we need to consider four variables. That's EH, EWE, 
SV, and SH. The elements of this environment hidden from the system are EH. So there might be things outside of the system that we still have to actually care about. The parts of the environment wanted by the user. Now, for example, the card. Now, the card which is inserted is actually outside of the system. The card can't actually be read. It has to be made sure that the user using the ATM will actually have a card. This is proved by making them insert a card, reading the magnetic strip, and requiring the user to provide their PIN. Now, the EV. The parts visible to the system in the environment are the data generated when the magnetic strip is read and the PIN number is entered. Now, the PIN number exists, but it is hidden from the system till it has been entered into the system. The data entered by the user is the visible part of the environment in that case. So once the PIN is entered, it will be environment information visible to the system that's using the interface. Now, the system elements visible in the environment is the S suite. This can include the buttons, the information on the screen, prompts that ask them to enter the card, prompts that ask them to give their PIN number, the stars that we see when we enter the values, we actually end up getting four asterisks so that no one can actually look over his shoulder and actually get your PIN. So all these are system elements visible to the user. And again, it sits within the interface intersection. Now it's something that's present in the interface. Then all the system data hidden from the environment is all the other data and elements of our system. So the roller inside the machinery that the user can't really see, they could maybe hear it. Uh, it depends on your definition of visibility, but it's typically understood as it's hidden from the user. So it's hidden behind the machine, it's hidden in the code, it's hidden in the data in the system. Now, for example, ensuring that an approval number is received from the actual bank prior to distributing money, though all this is hidden from the user. It does happen and it is important that it happens in the user hope that no one else gets the user's money. So let's just revise what we learned so far. The WRSPM model is a reference model to understand problems in the real world and helps us identify the differentiation between a requirement, the user domain information, and the specification. The system domain, how we'll be solving that problem. And you need to be very careful with separating the two and understanding the two, since there is a huge difference between writing down or capturing the requirements and then actually making specifications that really meets those requirements. Now, just because a system can do it, it doesn't mean that it necessarily meets the requirements. A good understanding of the entire WRSPM model helps you ensure that your specifications do meet the actual requirements of the user. Thanks a lot for watching the last videos and logging on to Tacademy, and welcome to this session. Today, we are going to take a closer look at a real world example to understand the WRSPM reference model in action. So this is the WRSPM model. We have is the world assumptions and the requirements both residing in the environment area of visibility. The S meaning specifications that sit within the interface between the environment and our system. Now the program and the machine itself. Now it has a software and a hardware that's set within the system's level of visibility. All right. Then we look at the control with the use of these four variables, which is EH, EV, SV and SH. So the elements of the environment hidden from the system are EH. The elements of the environment visible to the system are EV. The elements of the system visible in the environment are SV and the elements of the system hidden from the environment are SH. Okay, so all this might be a little relatively abstract. To have a better understanding of the difference between the requirement and the specification, let's consider a real world example for this. So we have a patient monitor that keeps track of things like heart rate, pulse, and such things. The desire is to have a patient monitor that is a warning system that will notify a nurse if the patient's heart suddenly stops. Now, it can do other things too, but we are focusing on this one user desire for this particular moment. So that's the user's goal. So the real requirement is that it should notify a nurse when a patient's heart stops or shows anomaly. So it is what the user actually requires. They require a system that does just that. But our system requirement, what we provide is that when the sound from the sensor goes below a certain threshold or frequency, an alarm will be actuated. So in this case, when we talk about a sensor, it is a microphone installed on the patient that actually measures the heartbeat. And we're talking about measuring the sensor's feedback when it measures the volume from that sensor. And when the sensor falls below a certain threshold, and what we mean by that is a certain volume over a certain period of time, once that falls, the alarm needs to be actuated. The question is, if this is satisfying the real requirement, because remember that the real requirement was that if the heart stops, the nurse is notified. Now this is different from not hearing the sound anymore. And if you have been in a hospital and handled one of these patient monitors yourselves, you would know that there are a lot of false positives. Now the sensor might fall off. 
It might not have moved or the sensor might not be sensitive enough to pick up the heartbeat. But such false positives, especially in a safety critical area such as a hospital, are usually considered to be okay. We could have the nurse check more often than not. So even though this system requirement comes close, it's not actually meeting the rail requirement. Now, something in between what we say we'll do to our system, that is the system requirement or system specification. And the user requirement, that is what the user really wants. Okay, here's patient monitoring. The requirements definition we write down is that we want a warning system that notifies the nurse if a patient's heart stops. That's what the user wanted. So that's how we captured what they want. We then talk about our system design. We can make a computer using a microphone as a sensor and a buzzer as an actuator. Now with the use of the system design, we could then talk about this requirement specification. Here's what's gonna happen. If the sound from the sensor falls under a particular threshold defined based on the user's need, this buzzer is actuated and it will work if a programmed properly computer is taken. Now, if you program the computer to buzz the buzzer once the sound from the sensor falls below the particular threshold, we will have a warning system through which the nurse is notified if the patient's heart stops. But we're still missing some key elements. These are the W from the WRSPM model. It's the world assumptions. Since there will always be a nurse close enough to hear the buzzer, this will always work. Now, nothing is said about the nurse hearing the buzzer. Now, that's a world assumption, right? We make a business rule assumption that there is a business rule that a nurse will be stationed at the nurse's station since that's where the buzzer is located. So if it buzzes and there's a nurse available there with the business rules require, the buzzer has to be heard by them. Now, what would happen if the nurses are hard of hearing or they're deaf? The buzzer can be heard by them. So when it comes to actuating our actuator, a buzzer may not really be sufficient. Maybe we need a buzzer with a light source. Maybe we need something like a vibrator that actually physically shakes the desk. So it's not only required that a nurse is close enough to hear a buzzer, it's required that a nurse is actually close enough to recognize our alarm after it's actuated. Also, there is a world assumption that when the sound of the heart goes below that threshold, the heart has stopped or is just about to stop. Now, this is a pretty simple definition, right? Just because the sound falls below the threshold doesn't necessarily mean that the heart has stopped or is just about to stop. It's not entirely true but it is not accepted to be true because the only other reason for it to go under the threshold implies that the sensor isn't in the right spot or it's actually falling off or for some other reason. We definitely also want the nurse to go back and check time and time again. Now, those are world assumptions that we haven't properly modeled yet. We will talk about our definitions back here of our requirements definition and requirements specifications, okay? So let me summarize today's session. The WRSPM model helps identify the elements involved in solving the problems. We had to be very careful when it comes to the world assumptions. The requirements are met when these things are true. Now, the specifications meet those requirements when and only these assumptions are stood out to be true. From a formal standpoint, if W and S, the world assumptions and the specifications imply these requirements are met, and the machine and the program imply that the specification has been met, only then will your solution stand to be correct. Now, most of the problems lie in that definition. It's that W and S, which will imply R. Now, many assumptions have to be made about the world and a lot of other things that are often beyond our control to make sure that that's actually true. Now, the same goes for M and P, the machine in the program, right? Just because our specification exists, it doesn't mean that it's been properly programmed and doesn't mean we've properly tested it. It doesn't imply the machine won't fail once in a while. Those are all things to be assumed when they imply S. So it makes this WRSPM model ensure that you're actually investigating all the assumptions to see that these two equations end up being actually met. So that brings us to the end of this particular session. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to this one. Now in this session, we're gonna discuss about software architecture. From this session, you will get a fair idea on the definition of software architecture and our perspective on that. For many people, architecture simply means building to building architecture. But there are many parallels between software architecture and actually building architecture. Now, architecture in all the fields is the interface between the customer's requirements and the person who is building it, the contractor or actually the implementer. Even the good construction cannot save the bad architecture across all the fields. While building, we cannot fix the bad architectural design. Very rarely, it can actually be fixed. Now, there are parallels on the working methodology of architect. For special projects, special architects are required. 
like building a skyscraper or building a dam or a nuclear reactor and so on. Everything needs a special architectural skill. Now, there are special kinds of projects in each field of architecture. In every field, different styles of architecture have emerged, and they will keep emerging as we work through the life cycle of all architectural projects. Now, when you see a building, it's very easy to either attribute to a particular architecture or at least in a particular architectural style. Even if it's building or an architect of software, it's basically the same. Now, in many cases, software architecture is not attributed to a single person, instead to the idea of building a large scale system. Now, a software architecture, there are three different definitions. Two of them are popular from books in the field of architecture. One of the books is from IEEE. Now, all these definitions come from the same idea, the idea of components. This idea of separating components comprising externally visible properties of these components and their interrelationship amongst them. Now, let us know more about partitioning large systems into smaller ones. And these smaller systems will individually and independently have business value. If they're linked properly with each other, and integrated with each of the existing systems very conveniently. Now, partition is the key component. There are several reasons for that. Now, in terms of software architecture, one of the things that we discuss about in terms of software architecture is a decision. For example, buy versus build. Just decide if the overall project should be built by an internal team or find an existing product, piece of software from the internet off the shelf. Customize it to your specific needs, which is basically buy versus build, which is a very common type of issue that you have to deal with and make the decision based on that. Now here architecture comes into the picture by taking a whole large system and partitioning it into smaller ones that may have built by your team or given the contract to someone else. Then we rarely integrate them into our system. Hence, the individual business value and the ability to integrate easily with each other becomes very, very important. Now, there are several reasons that should be taken into consideration. And most important is good architecture. This wide web has been architecture really well. If it wouldn't have been, then it would have been collapsed or it would have broken down because of its fragility. But it has been architectured in a very decentralized and client server architectural approach. Now this makes it very resilient to a lot of things that might otherwise collapse in such a large system because it's actually distributed very well because it's a large system. Now, good architecture is very challenging and success of large scale systems actually depends on that. It should be done with more dedication. Errors at the architectural level and the large scale level are very tough to handle. Now, in most cases, it's actually impossible to rectify with coding the construction part. Errors at the architectural level can have serious complications. Now, if the error is found at the construction phase, then it's impossible to just fix it and move on. Now, if it's a major design problem, then you have to deconstruct, demolish the whole thing and start all over again. Now, it's applicable in the software system too, and most of the companies are not actually able to solve that. Now, software architecture involves many different stages and funding is actually the biggest part of this. The primary reason for decomposing the systems into these components that are independent is that we can discuss about parallelization. Now, which team is going to work on project management, developing and test individual potential of large set of software, which will be integrated into this very large scale system. Now, while discussing about architectural patterns and architectural styles, we're mainly pointing at enterprise level software. Now, architecture at the small scale usually is not a big issue, but when you get into even the moderately sized pieces of software in an enterprise, then you have to deal with these kinds of issues, which includes funding of money, budget of paying the developer, the project managers, the designers, the testers, uh, and the testing and the beta testing and the user testing, acceptance testing to ensure that this project is actually a success. So everything should be transparent and you need to secure the funding to actually be able to do that. So software architecture is about looking at those components and analyzing their separation so that it's practical and can be solved in any given situation. Thanks a lot for watching this particular video and logging on to Techademy. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to the next one. Now, in this session on software architectural models, we will discuss about some models in detail along with software architecture. Now, for various common problems, there are many models which can be brought to best practices. These models are very effective and best practice solutions for commonly occurring problems at the enterprise level. So the first one is pipe and filter. Here we're going to take a common example. We have these two incoming data sources into two relatively large scale business logic entities. Now, there are different tasks in this, which has to be dealt with to process the data that's coming in. 
Now, the entire transform data will progress to business logic. So from an architectural perspective, I see that A and B are shared tasks across much larger systems. We would want to take benefits at the enterprise level instead of having two separate teams and building the same task twice. In this case, if the task has to be changed midway, then A and B could potentially start to diverge in their working styles. Now, this is not really a desirable state where one of them has a problem and the other one doesn't, with the same data streams coming in. It's going to become a really big problem while actually debugging. Now, we need to find the solution which provides the reusability of those shared sources and these shared subsystems. So we will have two data sources coming in, but we want to build these subsystems now in such a way that it can be shared. Now, these are the same modules shared across overall systems, and our subsystems can use one of these. We can do with a pipe and filter. It's about building these interfaces between the individual elements. Take an example of the Unix system. We get an output from one program, which can be directly inserted into the next program. This is simpler with regular text, and we can implement these solutions into anything with the same format for input and output. These components can be rearranged and reused in any order. For example, we want to apply element D in between parts E and F in the second subsystem. This can be done with a pipe and filter system. We can insert D directly into the process flow without actually changing anything. Ensure that the input and output formats are exactly same. Then only it works. Now let's take another common example. If the incoming data is being piped across parallelized versions of A, which then all piped B, which piped to C, which then again parallelized back to the business logic. Now this parallelization of information will allow three different processes, all using the same code base of A. Simultaneously, it will allow us to quickly get through that set. Now, for example, if that's the most performance heavy. Now, similarly for part D, if B is relatively quick, each individual process for A can all point back to the same B process. This can be reused in a linear version. The same process over and over is keyed down to the pipe and filter idea. The idea of same input and output formats are being used across all processes or all modules within the components. Wherever we want to expand, parallelize or reuse components across large systems like this, the pipe and filter architecture is very useful. This can also be applied to compilers where we have logical analysis, pair parsing, semantic analysis, and code generation. There could be some input and output which can be reused. Next, we come to Blackboard. This is the next primary goal for an architectural style for shared data. This is something like a blackboard with chalk, whiteboard, blackboards on the board, right? So this is the central place for information. It's like a hub of data where these components use some form of shared data or shared processing across all components. Now for important shared data without global variables, you use this blackboard. Now this piece of functionality will maintain integrity of that data or integrity of the operations across many calls from many different components. Components do not interact with each other. Instead, they interact with Blackboard. Now Blackboard serves as some kind of a message queue or other form of data repository, which can be used by each component. Here we have our provided interface, which needs to be very well defined so that any component can use it. This Blackboard includes a lot of functionality that other components do not use, and the tendency of these Blackboards is very big. This is not very easy for use, understandability, maintainability, and similar kind of things. Now, the important aspect is shared data. Then this architectural style may be useful for doing this format any good. Now, the layered architectures. Now, this is exceptionally common. You must have encountered something like business logic layer being separated from a data layer, the application layer, then tech on the infrastructure layer at the bottom. Here to ensure to separate these layers from each other in business, the UI layer is also listed. Now, in MVC or the ISO model for internet topology, there are many different layered architectures being discussed. Here, we are trying to separate core elements of the architecture, core elements of the entire system into layers in such a way that we can modify or vary it in any given stage. For example, the data layer without affecting application is different than this business layer. The interface is both provided and required in between the layers that protect each other, each external layer from the changes within itself. So we can make changes to the data layer as well as the application layer without having to change anything else. So this is also applicable for change in the UI layer. Here, if the user interface layer is changed, then the data layer need not be modified. Now, even if this is done, then you need to update the UI immediately. Now, for example, you switch from MariaDB to something like MySQL or Cassandra or Mongoose or something like that at the infrastructure layer. So without impacting or changing the code at the application level, you can do the partition in your own system. Now, the client server. It's also pretty straightforward. From your system, when you go to cloud and somewhere in Google server, you interact with that. The primary example of client server architecture is the internet. 
Here we are discussing about the primary, shared, or stored, or persisted information which is stored on a server, and many potential operations and programming goes there too. Now the client server uses that service to perform the tasks. Many times the UI is actually pushed to the client. Now there have been a lot of changes in this model. For example, the use of Ajax and JavaScript very heavily on the client side has shifted away from a pure thin client, fat server model into more of a mixed model, or let's say a fat client, thin server kind of model, depending on the kind of programming that ends up happening on the client or your system. When you actually go ahead and load a web page, right? So change this format to build your system because you have to consider the things that are happening on the server versus the kind of things that will happen on the client side. Next, we come to the event manager. Now this is similar to Blackboard, but it has some key differences. We have our event manager and each component is listed here. The event provides an interface for the components to be able to use. Now the event manager uses each of these components based on the events. So it's always based on some components that trigger an event, right? So that event is handled by the event manager and that decides which component will be handled by that event. Now, in every case, a component will be called by the event manager. It will push the event to event manager when the event actually happens. And the event manager will find the correct component to handle that event through adding attaching handlers, right? So it will call the component and it decides on the event which occurred to use the event manager in the loop over and over again. Now, this is mainly focused on event-based things. Now, when some event occurs, it takes action in response to that particular event. Now, the software architecture models are best practice solutions, right? So we try to explain it to you through a few examples. Now, there are various architectural models that can be used to find the solution for the problem. They are potentially code frameworks, which help us to build one of these architectural models. This will also help us to learn the partition of the work, to find the best people and the right quantity of hardware and software, budgeting and estimation of timelines to ensure that software project is in the best and the greatest position to succeed. Thanks a lot for watching this particular session. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next session. Now, in this session, we're going to look at software architectural process. There are three major concerns when you talk about software architecture design process. Now, the first one is system structuring, which refers to how the system is decompressed into several principal subsystems. Now, the communications between these subsystems are then identified. Once we separate elements or components, we need to be concerned about how they would continue to communicate amongst each other. This is important when you're going to parallelize the development work by giving the components to different development teams. Now, to have the interface as an agreed upon contract is a key component to make sure it all works. Once it comes back together and the system structuring is actually part of that. Next comes control modeling. This defines how architecture creates a model of the control relationships between different parts of the systems that's actually established. Now, this is mostly true when there are separate components and not just interfaces. Now that deal with the flow of control to communicate with each other. Then we have something called modular decomposition. This defines how we identify those subsystem partitions. We're considering things like simplicity, maintainability, reliability, security, and those kinds of quality attributes. Also, we're concerned about resource management. Now, in other words, we need to ensure that teams handle responsibilities that are actually appropriate to them and they have been tasked with. Now, when we talk about subsystem versus modules, there's a distinction. Subsystems are an independent system which could hold business value. They're part, they're not full product, but are some part of the product and can run completely independently. They can be developed entirely independently as well. So this is what we will look at when it comes to a subsystem. And this is the main objective of architecture. Now coming to modules, they are individual components of a subsystem which cannot function as a standalone system. It doesn't have business value. You need to gather and integrate multiple modules to make up a subsystem. Now, the distinction may still be unclear and it may not be a simple one for any developer or engineer to understand. However, the important element here is whether it can stand on its own. Another thing that we're interested in at the architectural level is software quality attributes. So you can see a list here and these are primarily referred to as illities due to the same suffix that they end in. Each of these is likely to be associated with architecture. Now, this does not mean that they can be associated with other stages in the process like requirements, design, or even implementation. But there's something which we mainly concentrate on at the architectural stage. You may argue with me on usability. However, let's look at something more important. Let's look at security. 
Now, at the design stage, one cannot do much to affect security. You would make class diagram, you would decide which methods to use. There are not many security concerns at that primary stage, but from an architectural perspective, you can discuss things like server configuration, operating systems that you will actually use, how to separate vulnerable subsystems from others, and how to talk about installing the appropriate software and security tools alongside the software you're building in order to make the entire software product work. So we are naturally discussing enterprise level planning when it comes to the architecture. Now, where and how does this eventual system fit within the current security constraints? How does it fit within the current performance constraints? How are we going to procure hardware? From where will we get funding for the developers to actually build this? How do we split up the work so that we can get it done quickly using the right people with the right talent? Now, these are the architectural concerns. A lot of it comes back to how we can have an effect on these quality attributes. How do we break up the system and split the responsibility such that reliability, performance, and security are ensured? Now, the software architecture process is concerned with three main things. The first one being estimation. So estimating the work and total, determining how much and how long it will take and who will actually do it. Number two, quality. How do we ensure reliability and performance at this architectural level? As there are primarily hardware and development focused concerns and partitioning, which is dividing the work into subsystems or modules, which then can be passed off into the design stage because design stage goes into the actual building of the individual models. Thanks a lot for watching this particular session and I will see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for logging in. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next one. Now, the we model of software development comprising of five stages design comes into the process at the fourth stage it comes between the enterprise level decisions in the subsystem designing and the development effort in fact we will go to see architecture and design phases grouped together in various places now the combined stage can be called architectural design or we can just call it architecture or design we shall split them so that we can be more specific and provide insight into each of the responsibilities separately now let us quickly understand about software design Software design is the deliverable. Design, the noun, and the process to make the design. Design the verb. It is a creative process of transforming the problem into a solution. Now, in our case, converting a requirement specification into a detailed description of the software that's code ready. The noun is the documented description of the solution with the required constraints and explanations. So let's take a brief look into what's not included in software. Design. One is architecture. Even though we will be covering architectural separately, but as a part of brief overview, architecture is focused on entire enterprise, which is primarily focused on overarching, cross-cutting concerns for the system. It will be used in large-scale decisions like, should we build or buy the software from another company? How the security would be handled? Should it be handled by the server or by the application? Now, the board of management tend to specify focus on these two, in allocating the resources and the personnel in making decisions whether the current staff and hardware can handle the project or will it require any additional resources to reach the target. Now, this is often considered to be an architectural concern while procuring the internal funding for such endeavors. So when it comes to design, the primary thing that needs to be addressed is to get a good understanding of the problem. We can get the good understanding from our requirements and specification documents. If you don't possess these or if you do not have it in written documents, it becomes even more important for us to get a full grasp of the problem domain even before starting to develop the design solution. Now, do not constrict your vision for any large scale solutions. Most of the times we will have multiple ways to reach the same goal. So before definitely deciding on the course of action to pursue, make sure to consider multiple alternatives available. When we see solution abstractions, it essentially means the non-technical documentation of the solution, which is anything that's not related to code or hardware. Now, graphical including mockups or wireframes, Formal descriptions including unified modeling languages or UML diagrams like class diagrams and sequence diagrams and other descriptive notation should be used in your description of the solution that you intend to build or have built for you. Here we will repeat all the abstractions, subsystem components under the entire design until the entire design expressed in primitive terms. Now, primitive terms is a bit subjective. We should always abstract and build a convincing design that even if you're not familiar with the developer team, we should be confident enough that they will come back with the right solution for our design.
We should let the developers who are coding in C Sharp or Java or Python to decide what kind of collection to be used at the code level. Let them decide exactly to sort. Those language-specific decisions should be left to the developers. Now, those decisions are not required to be made at the design level. We should only focus on what makes the overall solution work correctly, leaving all the language-specific optimization to the developer team. They follow our design and will work out the optimizations at the language level. Now, in both architecture and design, we will follow these six stages. The first three are architectural and the last three are related to design. We will set out to design the individual components, after we decide the system architecture, separate behavior responsibility into components and determine how these components will interact through their interfaces. Now, each component is designed in isolation. The benefit of encapsulation and reliance on those interfaces we design. Once each component is fully designed in isolation, any data structures which are inherently complex, crucial, or shared between the classes and components are designed for efficiency. Even the algorithms follow the same path. When the algorithms are particularly complex, novel, or important to the successful fulfillment of the components required behavior, we might see software designers writing pseudo code rather than the developers, only to ensure that the algorithm is properly built. Now, software design takes abstract requirements and then we will build the detail until we are satisfied that we can hand over it and it will be developed correctly. So we are gonna decide things like classes, methods, data types, but not the individual language specific optimizations that will go into the following code. So we are going to provide detail, which is implementation ready, but it does not include implementation detail. Now to summarize, software design is all about designing a solution which includes creating the deliverables and the necessary documentation so that it facilitates the developers to build something that meets the needs of the user or the client. The best people to carry out this task is the designing team. Now this is an important step that moves from our natural language understanding to code ready solutions. Thanks a lot for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to this one. Now in this session, we'll discuss about modularity. If we are discussing about modularity, then we are predominantly discussing about these four things. This would be coupling and cohesion. We'll evaluate how effectively module work together. Then effectively each independent module meets a certain single well-defined task and then tend together. Therefore, we will discuss about them individually. Now the information hiding will illustrate the ability to abstract information and knowledge which allows the complete complex work in parallel without knowing all the implementation details. Eventually, it concerns how the task will be completed. Now, the data encapsulation introduced an idea that within a module, we can contain constructs and concepts. So when we are observing the relative isolation, we can easily understand and manipulate the concept itself. Now, in reality, as part of the human preparation, the software development is the most composite thing. For instance, constructing a bridge is hard. But we can look at it, we can drive a truck across it, we can also see if the bridge cracks or sways or collapses. Now there are several physical world properties which must get adhered to. Then we can leverage to ensure that we have completed the work. Now software are not similar to that in any way. We may never notice under the main line of program there might be a huge crack. It will just be waiting to enter the wrong values and it will collapse right in front of us. Now it will be a very foolish task to endeavor to hold the entire concept of large scale programs at once in your mind. We don't have any other choice than to break down the problem into smaller parts. Now, after this process, we might be able to penetrate. Now, to process this in the proper way, we will be focusing on these three concepts over here. The first concept is decomposability. It is the ancient Roman concept of divide and conquer. Let's say when the problem is too large and complex, then we will break it down into smaller parts for proper handling until we solve the smaller part of the problem. Then we can resolve all the smaller parts after solving, we must put back all the smaller parts together. During this process, the compensability comes into play. As we see, this process is not so simple. We can also clarify with the NASA. During the mission of the Mars Climate Orbiter disintegrated, it has made a mistake in its units when calculating the thruster's total impulse values because one module was using pound seconds and the other was using Newton seconds. These were the little things which made that so difficult. Now we were discussing to begin by taking a complex thing. Then by adding, we will make it more complex. Now between the different developers or developer teams who knows many intersection points are there, it will become more difficult by the process of miscommunication. Therefore, by breaking down the components, we will try to focus on ease of understanding. Then it will hopefully lead to an ease of communication. When it comes to information hiding, then all we need to do is the ability to process something through understanding what it does, but not necessarily how. Until we understand what it does is strained, 
then it tends to work well. Now, for instance, let's take rand. What is the function rand process? It provides with a random number, but it's not quite right, right? The rand will generate enough random values for most purposes. But in reality, rand is a pseudo random number generator. It is based on a seeded value, which is not exactly a random. Therefore, we need real randomness, which doesn't fit the bill. It will work in various typical situations where real randomness is not necessary. We can see another example over here. Have you ever used the internal sort function in language? Do you realize how it sorts the values? Is it quick sort or merge sort or insertion sort or bubble sort? It might not be bubble sort, but the truth is we really don't know. We also don't really care for most part of that process. Now, in many situations, all we need to do is get sorted when we provide the array. There will be no performance issue when it gets sorted. In this, the information hiding is perfectly acceptable. What it does behind the scenes doesn't have to be really something that we care about if we actually know how to use it. Now, due to data encapsulation, it is a key point for protecting the data from unauthorized access and maintaining the integrity of the entire system. Now, the module developer has an idea of how and when the attribute should be modified. We'll then try to allow them to maintain as much as control as possible. Then no one is allowed to tangle with the respected data. Now, the data gets corrupted. There must have been done by the module. It is the intent. Now, by the robust over here, it specifies the chances of the new additions will not be going to break the current design. Therefore, when we discuss about modularity, we will be discussing about breaking down and reassembling all of these components. So when it's processed to coupling, cohesion, information handling, and data encapsulation, they're merely qualities, different perspectives on what modularity actually means. Thanks a lot for watching this particular session, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next one. In this one, we're going to learn about coupling and software design. Now, coupling and software design means the degree of interdependence between software modules. That is how tightly is the one module coupled to the other module. It is also a measure of how closely the modules are connected and the strength of the relationships between the modules. Now, one of the key components of modularity is the idea of decomposability that is separating complexity. Now, one way to minimize the effects of changes on the design is to enforce the separation between the modules. Now, when the requirement change, we will not require those changes to affect the entire system. This can be ensured by enforcing low coupling. We will have to make sure that the changes does not cross the boundaries of our modules. Ideally, when a requirement changes, we should make sure that the changes in our code is contained within a single module, the module which is tasked with completing this function. Now, our goal is to make sure that the other modules aren't affected when we carry out a change in one module. Even if it affects, we must make sure the changes are as minimal as possible. Now we can achieve this by effectively producing low coupling and by being attentive to the kinds of coupling we are using between our modules. Now, even though the mantra is low, coupling and high cohesion, we talked about the levels of coupling in terms of loose and tight coupling. Now those terms make more sense in isolation. Now the worst, strongest, highest forms of coupling are content coupling, common coupling and external coupling. Both content and common coupling occurs when two modules rely on the same underlying information. Content coupling occurs when a module is directly relies on the local data members of module rather than relying on some access or a method. Now, while common coupling happens when module A and module B both rely on some global data or on the global variable itself. Now, external coupling is a reliance on an externally imposed format, protocol, or interface. This coupling is unavoidable in some cases. It represents tight coupling, which means that changes here would affect a larger number of modules, which is not ideal. Now, for example, creating some abstraction to deal with the externally imposed format, allowing the various modules to maintain their own format, and delegating the format to the external into a single entity, not depending on the changes of the external format or the internal data. Control coupling happens when a module can control the logical flow of passing the information on what to do or the order in which to do it, or what to do is in a flag terminology. Now, changing the process may then necessitate the changes to any module which control that part of the process, which is not necessarily good in all cases. Now, data structure coupling occurs when two modules rely on the same composite data structure, especially when the parts rely on the distinct modules. Now, there are chances that changes in the data structure can adversely affect the other module, even when the parts of the data structure that were changed was not belonging to the other module itself. Lastly, we have the loosest forms of coupling. One is data coupling. Data coupling occurs only parameters are shared. These includes elementary pieces of data. 
For example, when you pass an integer to a function to compute the square root. Now, the next form of loses coupling is message coupling. It is primarily achieved through state decentralization and component communications, only accomplished either through parameters or message passing. Now, the next form of loses coupling is no coupling. Of course, you can have no coupling, but this is usually the trivial case and is not of much importance. In any complex design, there will definitely be multiple modules. So we should mainly focus on the modules that can communicate and not to focus on modules that cannot communicate in any way. Now, even though the mantra of low coupling is nice to say, it requires a deeper understanding of coupling itself. Now, we can always build better systems, better designs, and better solutions just by paying attention to the different types of couplings. Thanks a lot for watching this particular video and attending this session. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to this session. Now in this session, we're going to be looking at cohesion. Now the cohesion measures how well the components of a module fit together and work towards a purpose. Now this is subjective and the context in which you consider the purpose makes a difference. For example, imagine you're building a mobile game. So everything you do is interconnected to the idea of building a game. From advertising to user accounts to microtransactions to the game and the graphics, every line of code works towards the singular goal. However, this is a high level categorization. This is the reason why we discuss cohesion using various levels to define it in a better manner. Let us now start with the weakest forms of cohesion. Now, the coincidental cohesion is when the parts of the module are together just because they're in the same file. Now, if all the code are thrown into one file, then it is cohesive as they reside in the same file location. For example, it is in the same class in object-oriented programming, but this is a weak cohesion. The only relationship between the codes is their proximity. Next is temporal cohesion. In this, the codes are activated at the same time which is the only connection. Then we have procedural cohesion. This is time-based and not a very strong cohesion. Just because they come one after the other, it is not necessary that they need to be cohesive. What would happen if the process flow changes? So this is not really good. Now, logical association is when components which perform similar functions are grouped together. This is less weak, but still not good enough. Now at some level, the components do similar things, but they do separate or parallel things as well. So this is not a good reason to combine them in a module. So we should actually separate them. Then we have communicational cohesion. In this, all elements of the component operate on the same input or produce the same output. This is more than doing a similar function. Now, identical types of output is produced or working from a singular input is seen. Then we have the sequential cohesion, which is a stronger form of procedural cohesion. In this cohesion, one part of the component is the input to another part of the component. It is a direct handover and a cohesive identity. Finally, we have the strongest form of cohesion, which is object cohesion. In this, each operation in a module allows the object attributes to be modified or inspected. Each part is specifically designed for purpose within the object itself. And then we have functional cohesion, which is beyond sequential cohesion in assuring that every part of the component is necessary for the execution of a well-defined function or behavior. So not only input and output, but everything together is functionally cohesive. Now, technically speaking, inheritance weakens cohesion. This is because when you inherit, you would not have all the concepts in a single module when you're viewing the code base. You need to look at the super class files as well. This makes it harder to find detail and goes against the principle of high cohesion. However, this can be accepted as a trade-off for the benefits of inheritance. Although it sounds good when we say low coupling, high cohesion, the reality of measuring these things lies in the deeper understanding of cohesion. Now, by paying attention to different types of cohesion, you can build better systems, better designs, and better solutions. That's all for this particular session. I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to this lecture. Now in this lecture, let us discuss about the implementation and that is the work of developing the software itself. Now, there are a number of courses and other resources that are particularly useful about how we can program in Python, advanced Java features using databases, and everything that we need to implement to make our planned solution work. Instead, in this lecture, let's concentrate on some tips that will support us as a developer, but from a process perspective. Now, there are two aspects to this, and they're the works that actually work and when we work. Now, our research Stanford research study shows that the output of workers falls drastically after 50 hours a week, and it drops rapidly after 55 hours. As a matter of fact, anyone who works 70 hours a week generates on average not as much as those who work 55 hours a week. 
when we factor in technical debt. Now, someone who has programmed can tell us about the zone. It takes a long period of uninterrupted time to do well in the development process. Starting and stopping distraction will cause too much cognitive load, burning down the mental models and building them back. We should not let that betray itself by making us sleepless. Now, sleep deprivation usually leads to a lot of errors. So if you're managing the developers, ensure that they get some rest from time to time. When we stop by and they seem distracted by what they're working on when we approach, they might be trying to hold their mental model together for what they're working on. Try asking if it could be better to come back, let's say, after 15 minutes. Now, modern compilers perform all kinds of optimizations. While we are not supposed to write the additional loops that we don't need, remember that we are not actually saving that much from a performance perspective by removing those individual characters away from your variable names. Write the codes as self-documenting as possible and let the compiler handle optimizing the names of the variables. Now, let's take a look at this code. It's a good example of self-documenting code, or perhaps how to get a self-documenting code. It's not enough to have just the comments. Saying how isn't as good as telling why we did something. Then allow the code, like in the last example, to explain that the code is doing, and we shall use the comments to explain why we were doing it. Explain what's going to be there for the other developers to look at. So if they're going to come along and say how to actually maintain it. Now, we have already heard of test-driven development, right? But it's greater than that. Design has already been completed and have got the solution in mind. Write it out in the comments so that the following code makes sense in the context. We run into some document issues so that we don't have them back later. Now try to optimize and we forget what was the issue last time when we tried it. Now Google C++ style guide recommends that if the function is longer than 40 lines, then we need to break it down to simple focused functions, encapsulate complexity, and separate it by the use of multiple functions. Now this is just an extension of the keep in simple principle. The class is supposed to be intuitive and a less cognitive code needed to build up a better mental model. Now the main thing is the tip about the side effects. The changes to the data sources outside the method cannot be completely avoided or it might not be desirable to do so. But we have to minimize the side effects because those side effects are the error prone elements to the using methods. Now, this is basically a matter of productivity. We're supposed to make a method after the second time because it's the idea that as soon as we have used it twice, we probably might use it again. Now, the longer we go without the method, the harder it is to go back and take out from different places where the code is now used. So if you're using it twice, then we have to make it a method. Now, the last thing we need to do to remember this is that there are tools available for our benefit. If we really want to do the code optimization, the tools will help us. They identify the areas of code that benefit from optimization because the optimization is easy to find as we read the code. When we use the code profiler, it results in concentration of the work itself. Now, there are a lot of different places where we can get the implementation skills. Let us hope that these few ideas on the process side of things can help to concentrate when we are doing the development work, when we are implementing it, or when we are managing developers allowing them to be more efficient on the process side. Now, there's an engineering aspect to it that we want to make it as perfect as possible, but there may have to be a return on investment of that time that's been implemented, right? Or it's actually been put into it. So by following these tips, we will be in a position of using that return on investment for our time during the development process. So that's all for this particular lecture. Thank you. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to this session. Now in this session, we're going to discuss about rollback procedures as it pertains to software deployment. Now, deployment is the final event in the active deployment for any piece of software. It's in between testing and maintenance. Now the rollback happens when the deployment doesn't happen the way you want it to be. We must have a plan for reversal of actions too, when it doesn't work the way we want it or it has any kind of unexpected behavior. Now we have a process in place. For example, if some changes had to be made in production and in two weeks, we're going to make those changes, two weeks before the lead time, we need to give the plan and an approved rollback plan and reasons for the rollback. Now, the steps we're going to do are installation, data for configuration, changes in the databases. These are the steps that we're going to perform. These commands will be run to reverse the actions themselves. So if the installation goes wrong for any reason, we have our scripts ready for back out changes. Now, these changes are approved by managers, like data managers, system managers, that these commands will work to roll back the changes we're trying to make. Now, if in the middle something goes wrong and there is no planning to move forward or move back, we can always have our rollback scripts ready to effect that action. Now, many times rollback is related to the things which didn't happen the way we wanted them to. Some problems take longer time to debug and fix, and some can be fixed instantaneously if they're already known. 
But if you need production back online by a certain time, for example, if this is not fixed on time, then you might have to consider rolling back almost immediately. Now to keep the production alive is the real purpose here. Now deployment types are related in the production. A system needs time to roll back its production settings. Now a rollback procedure. This happens when something doesn't work. There's always a point of no return. That at some point rolling back is going to happen. Now at points, rolling back will take longer time and that becomes a problem. After a tipping point, which is past the point of no return, we have to push through. As backing out will take more time and becomes very costly as well. Now we may still need to do it because system is not updated or we may just want to push forward as is. The point should be noted and double checked even before you pass that point and check if you need to roll back before going to the point of no return. Now rollback is the main concern for deployment. We must be aware and should check the system out. But there are various ways in which this can happen. When you add a new file, you delete the same file, copying a new file or remove the copied file. Even the database updates if or you don't delete the file. It might even be permanently removed. Now, we can prevent the permanent deletion or such thing with the rollback. So rollback plays a really important role in the engineering of deployment. Thanks a lot for watching this particular session and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to this session. Now in this session, we're going to discuss about rollback procedures as it pertains to software deployment. Now deployment is a final event in the active deployment for any piece of software. It's in between testing and maintenance. Now the rollback happens when the deployment doesn't happen the way you want it to be. We must have a plan for reversal of actions too, when it doesn't work the way we want it or it has any kind of unexpected behavior. Now we have a process in place. For example, if some changes have to be made in production and in two weeks, we're going to make those changes, two weeks before the lead time, we need to give the plan and an approved rollback plan and reasons for the rollback. Now, the steps we're going to do are installation, data for configuration, changes in the databases. These are the steps that we are going to perform. These commands will be run to reverse the actions themselves. So if the installation goes wrong for any reason, we have our scripts ready for backout changes. Now, these changes are approved by managers, like data managers, system managers, that these commands will work to roll back the changes we're trying to make. Now, if in the middle something goes wrong and there is no planning to move forward or move back, we can always have our rollback scripts ready to affect that action. Now, many times rollback is related to the things which didn't happen the way we wanted them to. Some problems take longer time to debug and fix, and some can be fixed instantaneously if they're already known. But if you need production back online by a certain time, for example, if this is not fixed on time, then you might have to consider rolling back almost immediately. Now, to keep the production alive is the real purpose here. Now, deployment types are related in the production. A system needs time to roll back its production settings. Now, a rollback procedure. This happens when something doesn't work. There's always a point of no return. That at some point, rolling back is going to happen. Now, at points, rolling back will take longer time, and that becomes a problem. After a tipping point, which is past the point of no return, we have to push through. As backing out will take more time and becomes very costly as well. Now, we may still need to do it because system is not updated or we may just want to push forward as is. The point should be noted and double checked even before you pass that point and check if you need to roll back before going to the point of no return. Now, rollback is the main concern for deployment. We must be aware and should check the system out. But there are various ways in which this can happen. When you add a new file, you delete the same file, copying a new file or remove the copied file. Even the database updates if or you don't delete the file. It might even be permanently removed. Now, we can prevent the permanent deletion or such thing with the rollback. So rollback plays a really important role in the engineering of deployment. Thanks a lot for watching this particular session and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to this one. Now, in this, we're going to discuss about deployment strategies in the specific cutover strategies. We're going to create reliable system deployments and mainly updates. We will have overview on the potential cutover strategies and put them in the previous experience in this field. Now, in the bottom, the first cutover strategy, cold backup or cold storage must be considered at all points in time. Now, we have a ready physical hardware and the separate server. If we have a geolocation separation where you have a data center, for example, if you have one in Minnesota and another one in Arizona, 
If the data center in Minnesota goes down, a call can be made to the data center in Arizona. The access will be given after spooling the physical machine, and you can transfer all the applications and data and install the applications and then go ahead and configure them. Depending on the way the data is backed up, data replication into this cold backup storage device can be done at any given point in time. Now we have to decide which cutover strategy should be applied and time taken by them and the amount of money that will cost us to keep cold backup storage ready to go, which is comparatively cheaper to any other method. Now to recover from the failure, how much time will it actually take? Consider. If the data center in Minnesota goes down along with the entire applications, then how much time will it, the new version, which is in Arizona, take to run and work again in the production ready format? Let's say it will take about 24 hours. And this is the decent average for a cold backup storage for large scale software systems. If it is thousands of transactions an hour, then it will take care of this big system. It might take 24 hours to get all the approvals, all the installations, all the updated configuration, and then data replication. Verify the installation, test it out and then deploy it. We're considering it would take almost 24 hours, right? So this way, the cold backup will look like cold storage in our instance. So if you're taking thousands of transactions per hour, that was just not going to cut it for us. Then it's fair to deploy it in our own system. So we went one step up the ladder, basically. So let's talk about warm standby. It simply means we have a running machine ready to go, which is appointed. For example, install on location or in virtual machines, where with one click, it will turn on the machine. Now, Warm standby can be defined as a hardware that's already there. We need to deploy and install. Sometimes it's already there when it's turned on. All of the application installers, the entire configuration is already in place. Now in this case, just install or do the configuration step to get it up and running. But it all depends on the situation itself. Now suppose the data is not there and we're taking many transactions in every time frame. We would require some data replication to move across in the warm standby. If it's not running then, it won't be and effective data replication. So this is one of those biggest drawbacks. We need to replicate all the data since our definition is not going to data replication. So from this approach, it's proved that in machine, whenever we install a new version of production code, we should also update the warm standby simultaneously. Turn it on, update the software, and then turn it back off. Now everything is installed and configured and ready to go. We can now turn it on and do the data replication, do any minor configuration changes, and that whichever would be necessary, and then redirect the traffic to the new server. Now, in such scenarios, the warm standby takes between two to four hours. This also includes the time which was taken to decide if there is an issue and we need to do the warm standby. This may take between 15 to 30 minutes. Now, this time also includes the time taken to get the decision approved, and then we are moving to warm standby, configuration and data replication, turning it on, testing that it works before we launch a production-ready server. It can be almost up to two to four hours in total. But this time is also very high. Since we're doing thousands of transactions, two to four hours for thousands of transactions, you do the maths. It'll be almost in the tens and the hundreds of thousands. So it's a massive risk. It's not good to take that risk as we're moving to the next step, which is the hot failover system. So what is a hot failover system? The machine or virtual machine is ready and running. The systems are ready, waiting for transactions, but they just don't receive that information. This is different than load balancing. So for load balancing, we must use a set of production servers that are all identical, and you distribute load across all of them equally or based on the load balance diagram. But in hot failover system, the data doesn't go even if it could be handled at any time. This also includes our purposes. A hot failover can be defined as the data that has been replicated constantly. With a delay for five minutes also, the data was replicated constantly to hot failover site. Even if the transactions were not in production, live incoming requests were not going to hot failover site. The resulting data was being replicated across multiple sites. So the hot failover site will wait for those transactions to come through. We can use our redirector or our load balancer, as I mentioned, to change its configuration, redirect the input to our hot failover site. Now in a very short time, we can make the call, decide and possibly hit switch in the configuration file or a single database field which will automatically redirect the input from our external services into our new hot failover site. This will take less than 30 minutes to switch. We will have 15 minutes time for an on-call production support. So when I logged in, I had just 15 minutes of time to turn machine on and then log in. Then another 15 minutes to decide and then flip that switch. So 30 minutes was a good time for the data to replicate. So just one or two 15 minutes windows of time is actually required. We would need some additional replication. Uh, let's say if the data is lost in between, the production going down, and but the failover getting the redirect. We use this service pretty often. So now let's talk about something really important. It's called BCP or business continuity plan. Now, none of these cutover strategies will work unless and until they are tested before. And the cutovers are the worst thing that can happen. 
So testing is a must. We did a hot failover test once every quarter for our purposes. In every three months, hit a switch and send everything over to hot failover and it will run for a complete day. We do this additional updates, hence this production server got updated. Now do a hot failover to ensure it's working and that will be your BCP test. Then we would update production. Do hot failover back to production and ensure that the updates work and we can roll back by firing back to hot failover. So the production was good and set of updates in hot failover will keep running. Production taking data and hot failover is just waiting for the information. Now the difference between load balancing and cutover with respect to hot failover is actually a geolocation separation. They're separate places and hot failover basically does not receive data. So if you have a load balancing system that has geolocation separation, which is constantly sending data to multiple places, then we don't need hot failover. It's just a geolocation separation in terms of load balancing, and that's exactly the way to do that. But the problem arises when one of them goes down and some data has to be replicated. And how do we know which data to replicate across? So this was a challenge that was solved by hot failover site not being used. Entire data can be replicated, but only in one direction. This will save the bandwidth, a lot of processing, and setting up our cutover process. So this was all about the three cutover strategies, and you will now have a fair idea of their implementation on your specific system. Thanks a lot for watching this particular video. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last few videos, and I'm very glad you logged into Tacademy. Now, welcome to the session on how testing fits into the software development lifecycle. Now, there are a few definitions here for different people. The general meaning is that it is a process of finding errors that's common between all of them. It's universally agreed that the purpose of testing is to find problems one way or another. The testing of documentation is excluded from the first definition, but it is definitely something that we do, actually. So a lot of testing is done that involves documentation and making sure the documentation that eventually leads to the program is also right. Now let's begin with the most basic question. What's a test? We start with the software under test. Something that hasn't been created can't be tested through test-driven development, unlike agile development, where we decide what the test is going to be before the code is written. It is another perspective we can take. We're talking in terms of actually running the test. Something can be done only after you have the software to execute. Now, when I say software here, I don't mean the complete finished software product. It is actually quite the opposite, even though we will eventually test the entire product. Software under test means whichever part or subset of the program that has been completed, where we can exercise something or exercise some behavior. This is some module or unit of code, therefore unit testing. Now in this context, units usually mean something like a method or a function, a subroutine, a procedure, something that is small. It could be defined set of steps or tasks that we have, an expectation of how it should behave when that code is run. Now to run a test against our software or our unit, the information to act on has to be provided. The input, the test data. There are many ways to choose or even generate that test data. Test data can be generated based on a profile we've constructed on how we think the user is going to act based on probability or user studies. Or we can go against the code with some data that will cause errors. Inputting zero or inputting a number that is larger than what is asked for, entering a word instead of a number, those kind of things. However, we give the inputs and these forms will be tested. Now for each of these inputs, we run the software under test and give that test data after setting up the software to be in the right state for that software test data to make sense when it's inputted, something we'll get back to in a little bit. Once we give the test data to the software, we match the output. We will then see the behavior of the program with that given input. The question that is, what do we do with that observation? Is it correct? Has the software provided the proper result with the given test data? Or is there someone that needs to check that out? Something has to say that it's true or not. Now there's something or someone is what we call the Oracle. Typically the developer or the tester running the tests has been the Oracle. The tester will run the software and input the data. They observe what happened and decided the behavior matches what they were expecting. I don't know if you came to know this or not, but humans aren't particularly reliable. <laughs> Can one really be sure about which one is a number one and which one is a lowercase uh, in some fonts on the screen? For such reasons, we have begun to see things are like automated oracles that can compare known or determined or retrieved expected output to the actual output. The generated output, so the actual output of running the software under the test given the test data with the input and output, we need to see if the program we're hoping we could with the test data from the test cases. Okay, now we will look at how a single test tends to happen. So as you know, there's a difference between test data and test cases. The test data is just the input to the program. And usually that is all we think about. For example, to test the square function, you're really thinking about inputs like minus two, three, or five. What about one, 
What about minus one? Well, we also really need to make sure that a test case has the data, both the input and the expected individual output. Like I said, humans were traditionally the Oracle. Now we will have an automated Oracle. So you will need both input and output. Within these two, a computer will read all the given pairs and execute the test quickly. Now, what do we say when we mean a bug? We run all the tests and we find bugs. So what exactly does a bug mean? Okay, so system failure happens if the delivered service deviates from the specified service. That means that something didn't go according to plan. The specification is an agreed description of the expected service. The failure happened because the system had an error. An error is a part of the system state that has the liability of leading to a failure. It's the reason that leads to delivery of a surface that will not comply with how it's specified to work. The cause in its phenomenal sense is called a fault. A fault is what actually occurred. Upon occurrence, a fault or a mistake creates a latent error. The latent error sits in the code and becomes effective only when it's activated. It is activated when the code actually reaches the point and it becomes different. This is when the error actually affects the delivered service. This is when the error really causes a change in behavior that is not expected to be seen by the user. And so that is how a failure actually happens. A fault manifests into an error and an error on the service manifests into a failure. So let's take a quick look at some examples. So a programmer's mistake is a fault. The result of the fault is a latent error in the written software. It is potentially an erroneous instruction or a part of data defined incorrectly. The error becomes effective only upon activation of the module where the error is located and an appropriate input pattern is present. That's when the error becomes effective. Now, when the effective error produces erroneous data or behavior, it could be the timing of the delivery, the value or anything else that doesn't happen the way the user thinks it must happen. That is basically the failure. So latent errors could sit in a program for a lot of years before an input pattern finally runs the code in a way that produces a behavior that wasn't expected. So I'll give you one more quick example. A maintenance manual or operator manual writer's mistake is considered a fault. So they come up with an improper manual. The result is an error in the corresponding manual. Incorrect directives on how to use the software, which will remain latent or unseen as long as the directives aren't acted on. Or for example, when one thinks it is easy and they don't read the manual. But if someone does read the manual and tries to use that wrong instruction on the manual and run the code, and then the code doesn't work the way they think it should, that's still going to be an error and therefore eventually a failure. So Edsker Dijkstra, a pioneer in computing science, was into structured programming and the banishment of Go too. So if you hear of a Go to is considered harmful, that article is written by the same person. He said, program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never their absence. We can run all the tests we want and see if they find a bug, but that's all we can really do. So when do we stop? When to stop testing is a very important question to ask yourself. And there is no good answer to that. Uh, no amount of testing will be sufficient to prove that all of it works with all probabilities and all circumstances taken into play. So the purpose of testing is seen as to prove that a program is no good, okay? That's all there is to it. That's all that can be done. We test to prove that it's not good. We can never test to prove that it is good. So when we test and it produces errors, it's no good. So software testing by itself is a process to find defects and hopefully lead to the fix of defects in your implementation. There's no way to prove that it's all going to be correct, not really not through testing anyway. But nevertheless, it's a really important part of the process. We have to make sure that we have quality inputs and the correct expected outputs for any of this stuff to work. And all of this will boil down to the critical question. Should this software be released? And testing is the stage in the process where we say, no, it can be released yet since certain things are still wrong. So it's a very critical piece and also it often a very time constrained process, but I wanna make sure that you know and understand the importance of software testing in software development life cycles. So I'm gonna end this session by saying this and see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching this one. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to the next one. Now, as we discuss in detail about testing and the role it plays in the software development lifecycle, it's time to define some terms. First, verification and validation. These are the two widely used important terms in software testing. Before we define these terms, let's go through some definitions from around the industry. Here's a definition from IEEE. It's not an ideal definition. Let's take some time and understand it. The issue here is that the definition is pretty general. The notion that it's fulfilling conditions imposed against fulfilling specified requirements. It is not giving us a lot until we understand the meaning of those words. When we talk about fulfilling imposed conditions, it essentially means that the conditions imposed on the system by the developers as we try and adapt from what the user wants, the requirements into what the system does so that it can meet those specified requirements. Hence, these are the actual conditions imposed. It is basically what we want from the system itself. 
Validation then becomes verifying if it fulfills the specified requirements or not. They are not exactly precise with the definition of the word specified here. Hence, the way we construe the definition implies that it is specified as in told, explained by the users, it's what the users actually want. Hence, the requirements are not essentially a written down document that we would want it to be, but it's what the users want. Therefore, validation becomes if it could fulfill what the user said they wanted. Let's not just trust that definition. Instead, let's elaborate on it. Now, here are a few other definitions. Professor Kaner wrote, at one point, the best-selling book on testing. So this is how he defines these terms. When they discuss most closely related design documents or specifications, it is specifically about what is written down that we said that the system will do against validation. Verifying it against the published user or system requirements, the requirements of the system in the user language. Hence, this is pretty close to what we perceive as verification and validation. However, it again just focuses on design documents and specification versus validation requirements. So let's go through another definition. This comes from another big name in testing. It's Glenford Myers. In his book, he defines the term in this fashion. This definitely covers testing and does a pretty good job to explain the difference between verification and validation for testing. It's an attempt in knowing errors by accident programming in a test environment against executing it in the real environment. Now, there is a chance of looking at this definition in a narrow way. Validation is still about executing the real environment, but may not include the user. Our thought process is that the user is a key component to validation, it being valid. Hence, let's see the correct definition or well, our definition. This is how we consider verification and validation. Verification means that it conforms and performs to its specification when we wrote down as it will do this. This is essentially our definition. The user requirements are met if it does these things. Now we see a big transition between what the user wants and what we said we will do. There is a possibility of errors creeping in there. However, we should write down what we want so that it can be given to the developers, designers, architects, and they will build the system. Therefore, we write that down and then check what we build matches, and then we actually go ahead and set out to build that particular transition. Now, are we building the right thing? And are we building the thing right with regard to what we wanted to build? This is called verification. Now, the validation then becomes, is it conforming to the user satisfaction? Is it what they wanted? If it's what they need, it is not necessarily the same thing, right? So what do they mean when they say what they want or need? And what they actually want and need can be different things on a lot of occasions. Hence, validation should happen on two different levels. If this is what they need, we should watch them use the supposed solution and ensure that it is working the way we think it will. We should also ensure that the users are actually satisfied with the way it provides what they asked for. Therefore, are we building the right thing? It is not only that, have we accomplished what we set out to do? Does that thing that we built right actually do good things? Is it any good from a usability perspective? Is it good from a security viewpoint? Is it good just in a pure user satisfaction level? That is validation. Now we accomplish it through two different things, dynamic and state verification. So dynamic validation and verification or VNV, dynamic VNV involves exercising and observing product behavior. It basically runs the thing and observes what happens. Hence we call it dynamic as it is running the system. In a way, it is basically testing all forms of testing. Now, if you look at the Myers definition again, this is what we should look at. Myers definition of verification and validation saw him talking specifically about dynamic verification and validation, running the system and seeing what happens. If you look from the viewpoint, his definition is pretty good between running in the testing environment and running in the rail environment. We also have static VNV. Static VNV is basically about looking at established representations of solutions that are not necessarily running the system. This could include looking at code in terms of code inspection, a code review, or even pair programming we see in a lot of agile methodologies. Now, static VNV is basically looking at the code and seeing things right without running it. It can also be termed formal proofs or model checking. Hence, if we went ahead and performed a theorem based proof, mathematical type of proof for solutions of code and prove that it shall work, prove that it is indeed secure, that constitutes a static VNV method. We do see a lot of that in formal verification and in formal testing. Now, we come across a lot of that in terms of security based testing or static VNV not necessarily dynamic VNV. When we look at it from a security standpoint, it is something like penetration testing, trying to gain access to the system when it is actually running. Hence, when we talk about verification and validation, all we care about is building the thing right and building the right thing. In order to accomplish that, we should employ a lot of different testing methods. Hence, we shall talk about all the different methods and tools we can use to provide verification and validation. This is true for both dynamic as well as static VNV. Now we have to remember that verification is a lot easier and therefore it's cheaper. 
Well, there is a standard. That is why we shall build. It's relatively easy to verify it. Did we actually build that? So it's a lot more difficult and expensive to prove that what we built actually makes the user want to buy it. So thanks a lot for watching this particular session, and I will see you in the Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to the new one. Now, this is going to be a video on strategies and software testing. First, let us look into incremental testing. In incremental testing, regression testing forms a major part of it. Now, suppose we start with two modules, A and B, with corresponding three test cases numbered one, two, and three. Now, after we are done with testing modules A and B, we will not get rid of the tests, we will keep them. Thereafter, we will add new module along with the test case in isolation. We will add module C test along with modules A and B, and then we will execute all of them together. By this way, we can determine whether our new addition of module C has resulted into any changes for the previously correct code. We will keep adding modules with their tests and re-execute all the tests as we go. Now, this technique of re-executing the older tests in a larger suite is called regression testing. This forms a big part of incremental testing. Now, next one is incremental testing is a top-down testing. While building the level one software, we will also have to develop some elements at lower levels that we haven't created yet. Now, these lower level elements are called stubs. With the level one software we are building, there will always be a few level two software that it relies on. For example, an object that I instantiate to do some task. There might be three or four of those which haven't been built yet. Now, with the help of a stub, we can do those tasks in order to make sure our program works well. Now, a stub is a single line or a few lines of code. When added, it essentially just returns into a hard-coded value that stands in for a real return value. Now, the same kind of thing can also be done with a mock. Differences between stubs and mocks are, mock is something where you actually don't hard-code something. So we will build out the level two software with stubs or mocks all the way across the board like this. Of course, level two software again relying on underlying level three software. So we will have to make stubs for level three. Hence, as we build the code, we will have to build lower levels of software or stubs below these to continue our work towards the underlying levels. Now, the next approach is bottom-up testing, which is the opposite of top-down testing. In this approach, we will have the lower level implementations complete, but we will not have the larger picture of integration execution drivers. These drivers walk through the process of lower level elements and makes reasonable calls to ensure that the lower level is operational. Now, the issue with building good drivers is that sometimes it's hard to know the kinds of inputs and the order of inputs that will be required to properly use at level three before building level two software. We will all have to do our best, make the best assumptions regarding the most common and most important orders of operations and make sure that our level two operations are complete. Now, once these are done, we will start building the level two software. Now with level two software, we will need to build a level above that, a level one driver, and that drives all the level two software together. Next, we have back-to-back -back testing. Now in back-to-back -back testing, it's one way we make use of earlier iterations of a program as an effective automated oracle. This is particularly useful for expanding test data without necessarily including expected output. The idea is to check the program that worked before. Now for all the things that worked before, we will run the test data both through the old version and the new version. Since it worked before, it should continue to work and the output should be the same. It facilitates us to do a direct comparison of the output. Accordingly, if the developers make any changes or modify some features to fix something, we can run the test data through both iterations and make sure the outputs are different. It still takes some manual inspection to check that change result is right. At least it's a start, especially when you're working with Scratch and you don't have any automated tests from the beginning. So now let us look into test scaffolding. The goal of test scaffolding is to set up an environment for executing our tests. First one that facilitates to execute our test is the driver. Driver initializes non-local variables initializes parameters and activates units under test. The next one is stubs. It will use templates of the modules, which is not working. Templates of the modules used by the unit, including the functions and templates of any other entity or data structure that is used within the program unit. Now, the last one is Oracle. It verifies the correspondence between produced and expected results. More often, the Oracle is just as a human. We will run it and make sure that the output is as expected. These are increasingly automated Oracles that we are using in things like star unit, J unit, PI unit testing frameworks that we can use to automatically verify that our stub, driver, and program unit have operated properly. So now let us learn a bit about trade-off. We can build very sophisticated, well-designed drivers and stubs. It requires a lot of effort in developing those drivers and stubs. 
so that it will require lower effort in text execution and regression. Now on the other side, we have these poorly designed stubs. There are stubs with simple single return value of a single hard-coded value. Return true, return three, return the string go. They are poorly designed drivers and stubs, so it doesn't take very long time to develop, but there is not a lot of reuse with these stubs. So next, let us learn as to who should test the code. Should it be the developer himself or the tester? The strategy here as well, if you're a developer, if you have built the code, then that's your baby. We will usually have an egotistical view of your own code. We tend to think our stuff is obviously awesome. Therefore, we tend to treat it a little bit differently. The problem with this is we tend to test what we have built and not what we should have built or what the user wanted. We also tend to test very gently and we will usually be driven by the deadline and start working on the next project, module or the method. Hence, in this way, we can leave some dark corners as part of the program. The tester, on the other hand, will have the attitude of breaking things because breaking things is always good. Hence, it will increase the quality of the code. They do have to learn the systems, but there's an uptick and a learning curve for the testers in that case. Now, let us look into the axioms of testing that go along with the strategies of testing idea. Anytime you find defects in a piece of software, the probability of finding more bugs increases. Now, this case is one of the most controversial axioms. In such case, we will assign the best programmer to testing for this case because the best programmers have the best understanding of the quality, programming, and how to break things as well. They will also have a good idea of the overall design. So they can do a better job in integration testing of making sure that things are coming together properly, of having a better view of the overall system as well, so that the developers can go back to the junior developers and help them develop better in testing, debugging, and defect reporting process. We should also understand that exhaustive testing is not possible in most cases. We cannot run and test every combination of inputs. Therefore, we have to create a strategy so that we can attack the most important and the most critical aspects of programs while we're testing. And obviously we cannot do everything, so we will have to prioritize the job. Even if we do find the last bug, we will never know. There's no way to know that there's not any other bug sitting there anymore. Now remember that testing only exposes the bugs and it doesn't prove the code is perfect or certifies the absence of bugs. So when we run all the tests and they're all passing, it doesn't mean that the program is actually without any defects. It just depicts our test cannot find them anymore. So it will always take more than the expected time to test. We will run out of time before we run a test case. If that's not true, that means we, as the tester, have not done our job correctly. If we still have time to test, we should always create more test cases. Now, the next topic is that the strategies of testing drive the actual act of testing units. Recall the pure top-down and pure bottom-up approach. In the practical world, there are less implications of these approaches as the idea of building level one all of level two, then all of level three, and so on. And it really doesn't happen that way. We tend to have certain silos of code that need to be done before anything else can be started. So we tend to start seeing more depth first rather than going layer by layer. We should still understand the idea of any individual layer can have both drivers and stubs built for them. Programs cannot be tested completely. So we should have an idea of the samples and places we have to test considering the bottlenecks of time, budget, and the money that we possess. Now, the practical budget testing constraint is probably the most common one in the real world. So we should have an idea of what we're going to test because this is the safety critical and most important for our users, and this will have the most impact on performance. Thanks a lot for watching this video. Amongst the other ones, thanks a lot for logging on, and I will see you in the next one. welcome to this particular session. Now, in this session, we will discuss a few testing perspectives. We already have learned about a few testing perspectives in a little more detail. Now, the testing between black box and white box is the most well-known distinction. The term black box, we may already have heard about it. It is significant with airplanes. An airplane is the navigation of the black box, which records what happens in events of a crash. The idea of this context is when we look into the black box, we don't actually see anything. Therefore, in testing, we don't have permission to look at the code. Actually, we shouldn't know anything about the code. When we determine how we will test the system to make sure it works properly, all of these are behavioral approaches. We see how resilient the system is or how fast it could respond. Now, the white box testing is the mirror for that. The testing will be primarily based on the code itself for the structure of the program. Essentially, these techniques make sure that we test all the lines of code and error-prone or strike-fragile elements, which had been used in constructing the program. Now, when we talk about error-prone, it doesn't specify that there are bad things to utilize. Arrays are very fundamental to process how the programs will work. 
Now, both the beginning and end bounds, which were closer to the ends of the area, will tend to be a major location to produce mistakes. Now, this is something we label as an off by one error. These mistakes occur by the nature of how arrays work. In fact, it doesn't say the arrays are bad, they are just indifferent. It is to take care in how we work with them. So we make sure these major locations for utilize to test are actually done properly. Now, VNV is a process of the whole life cycle. When we discuss validation and verification, then at every step, we should be processing it. We also make sure that we construct should be similar to what we set out to actually build. Then we make sure it's going to encounter the needs of the users. Now, in an agile team, it will be more obvious. The common key component of the team with a user representative. After the developer is potentially verified, the user needs to provide the validation of work in which they have processed to set out at every step of the project. It is also important in finding and fixing the defects or bugs. It is not only to find and fix behavior, we need to provide quality in the product. Now in the other vectors of quality, it has to measure or evaluate the system. Now we know this process will work, but we must understand how well it would work when the CPU has a 90% load. At the same time on the system, there are a lot of users does the database connection usage will reach its limit. Now, unexpectedly, if a server shuts down, then what happens? How easy would it be to hack the system and corrupt data? These things are not the necessary behavior to be done by the system, but it is very important to know how the system works. Now we will discuss the stages of testing. If you're discussing unit testing, then we will be discussing testing of individual components. This specifies an individual method or potentially a single class within the solution. The set of units is the module testing, which comes together as a collection or dependent component. For integration testing, this is the first form. It says how we will test when things come together. So this is a thing that needs to be tested in isolation. Now, for instance, let's say we have two drawers and it can be opened because the first drawer will run into the handle of the second drawer. This forms an integration testing, which we have to process. After we get the module set up, then we can process the subsystem and components testing. Now the modules of testing collection will be integrated in a subsystem. This testing is basically concerned to ensure the interfaces between the subsystems and components, which is in between the modules components. It will encounter the specifications that have been given when it is frequently divided between the developing teams. Now, since the individual developing team can construct their modular components, so this process might work, but it will not work quite a way that would work together when we place the components or modules together. So testing for this type of thing will include the integration of the components. We make sure as intended, the components will work together. Going ahead, we will shift from subsystem to full system testing. We will test the complete system from initial to dispatch. Now, there are a lot of things which goes on with the developing team to make sure the whole system works and gets back with the output as security, performance, usability, etc. Finally, the acceptance testing, which is testing by the users. It is also called alpha testing, beta testing, etc. Now, in deployment, even though we didn't call it an alpha or beta, the user will get delivered all the same. The user will find bugs and report them back when they're using it. This is also a form of testing. This might probably be the worst form of testing since we didn't need those things to get to real users, but this is also a form of testing to find errors. Now the black box and white box verification and validation or VNV as it might be called as unit, module, component, system, acceptance testing. These are all different ways of considering the testing as a whole broken down into categories, but none of these are mutually exclusive. We must employ each of them and we should be highly experienced in all of the perspective techniques. For instance, in isolation, sometimes the black box versus white box should be split, but we will utilize them together to get the best chance of success in the overall testing scenario. Thanks a lot for watching this particular video. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the video so far and welcome to the next one. In our last session, we got to know about different software development processes like requirements, design, and testing. Now in this session, we shall learn about how to put these pieces together to create a workflow that a team can use to build software. Now there are lots of models available and we can create our own. But in this session, we're gonna learn about different industry standard models that are available, which we can use for a team. Now, in this case, the first question that comes to our mind after saying all this is, why do we need so many models in the first place? This isn't a fashion show, right? Can we just have one model and everybody just follows it? We know that every team, every project, every organization is different and the limitations on any project could be different. Hence, one model may fit a particular project, but the same model may not fit a different project. 
That's the reason it's important to learn about different models so that when we're in a situation to select a model for our project, we can choose the right model we need. And since there are so many models available, we shall first learn how to classify these models so that it helps us in understanding these models a lot more easier. The first kind of classification of these models is predictive versus adaptive. We should learn about this classification. Predictive means that we have a good understanding of the requirements of the software or the product we are building. In this case, the client or the analyst knows what exactly they want, and hence they have a very high confidence of the requirements. Now, once the requirements are defined completely, the team goes through the design, implementation, and testing phase. The process that we have learned and finally produces the product that the client requires so that they get exactly what they're looking for and what they had in mind originally. Now, we can see a couple of things in this model that we get the product in one shot at the end. And since we knew the requirements in the beginning, there is generally a desire not to allow changes during the development phase. And so whatever we decided to implement, we continue with that during the development process. Now, there is another way of treating requirements, which is adaptive model. In adaptive models, the client or the customer basically has an idea of what they want to build, but not 100% sure what they want to build. So in such case, they start with an idea. The team that is working on it will build something like a small version or a less accurate version of it. And then they show it to the customer or the actual users and later build the next version based on that feedback. They change as they get the feedback continuously. Now let's imagine after the two increments, they get a major feedback, which says we must go in a completely different direction. So again, the team moves into a different direction and start transforming the product into something else and so on. Later, there could be another feedback where they learn about something new. And in the end, we might end up getting something different than what we were originally thinking. But actually, what we get is what users need because all along they were getting feedback as to what will work or not, and they actually build a product. That's what we call the adaptive model. Now, most of the models we talk about may not always be purely predictive or purely adaptive. They're sometimes somewhere in between. And it definitely depends on how much we allow change during that particular process. Now, the second classification of models is incremental versus iterative. This is about how we actually build the software. Let's first learn about incremental. Now, in an incremental model, we have a pretty good idea of what we want to build. But instead of building it in one shot, like what we learned in the predictive model, we build it in increments. For instance, let's say we wanted to build a car. So to build a car, the first step is that we can build all the engine blocks. Then we get to create all the tires. Once we create the tires in the next increment, we create the chassis for the car. And in the next increment, we can put together the engine, the seats, the steering, and some more pieces and so on. And then finally, we're going to have our car. As we can see that in the increment, we still have a good idea of what we want to build, but we are building it in increments. In the incremental model, it will be useful if our organization can benefit from some of these intermediate products or if they're going to change the later increments based on the feedback from the previous increments. The other model is the iterative model, where we don't have the clear idea, but just a semblance of some ideas. For instance, let's say our idea was to go from place A to place B. In an iterative model, we will think about we need something to go from place A to B, and we're not sure if that will really be needed or not be needed at all. So instead of building the car, why don't we just build a bike for us, which is less expensive or needs less effort, and see if we need that or if we need to transform it. And so we build a bike and then say, it takes a lot of time to go from place A to B. So in the next iteration, we might build a bike and actually put an engine onto our bike. And now it becomes a motorbike and so on. So at some point of time, we might build a car or a semi truck or something like that. But in an iterative model, we sometimes replace what we have built with something completely different. Hence, the difference between incremental and iterative is that we are building on top of the existing product. And then in incremental, we're just breaking the product in smaller pieces. Whereas there is enhancements that are happening during an iterative model. Now, if we look at the incremental model, on the other hand, it can go predictive as well as adaptive. If we take the feedback from each of our increments and change our future increments, then it becomes a little bit adaptive. If we don't take the feedback from each increment and just keep building one increment and then another increment, then it's more like a predictive model. Now, those were the two kinds of classifications that we wanted to share. So where are we now with that? Now we need to add two more variations to this classification, which is both or none because some of the models have both going together. Some of them like agile models are incremental as well as iterative. And there are also some models which have neither increment nor iterative. They're purely one shot development. For example, the predictive model, which is an example that we showed in the previous slide where we had a definition of the product in just one shot, we created the product. We would call it the none category. Those were in the classifications. Now we should learn about each of those models. What are the different things that we will talk about? Let's take a quick look. We will start with the name of the model. Later, we're going to talk about the mechanics of the model. 
Once we talk about the mechanics, we'll talk about some of the characteristics of the model. Then we'll get into where in the predictive and adaptive phase this model stands. Then we talk about pros and cons of the model and about where we can use this model. Now, this is basically going to be our template for all the models we're going to discuss. We're going to follow this sequence and learn about these aspects of each model. So let's learn more about these models and a lot of other interesting information in the sessions to come. Thanks a lot for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the video till now and welcome back to the course. Now in this lesson, we shall discuss about one of the simplest models we can create by putting all this software development process together. It is called a waterfall method. In the waterfall method, we basically put all of these software engineering processes, one after the other in a logical sequence. We first do all our requirements. We then proceed to design, implementation testing, deployment before it gets into maintenance or operations. Now, what if something goes wrong? Or suppose we are in the middle of implementation and suddenly found out this is not what we actually needed. To overcome that problem, we shall not just continue going down the road. Instead, we shall go ahead and fix it first. Now, in order to fix that problem, we add this feedback loop from each phase to the previous phase. Hence, if we find something wrong in the implementation phase, we go back to the design phase. If there was a problem in the design phase, we go into the requirement phase. If the problem existed in the requirement phase, we keep going back to the previous phases. Now, once we fix something in the requirement phase, we come back to the design phase. We then continue into the implementation phase. We should keep in mind the later we identify the issue, the more costly it's going to be. Now, you may have encountered this cost of change curve in the past. It is basically showing how costly it is if you find the bug later on in the stage. In case of production, it's closer to 150 times costlier than if you find it earlier. We should find the problem early. What is in our favor in these models is that we know the requirements very well and they won't change. We just discuss how costly it could be to go back and repeat the steps if the requirements change later in the phase. Therefore, to have a successful model, we need to ensure that the requirements are solid and all the other phases go smoothly. The second exemption we could make as far as this model is concerned is that this team has experience building similar software. Now, for instance, suppose a team is building a software for an automatic teller machine or an ATM machine, and they've never ever done it before. After getting the requirement, they start to design the software. Since they have never done it before, they took some design decisions that may not have been correct. However, they will continue to build it only to realize later that they have made the wrong decision. They made the mistake as if they were not aware of it at that stage because of having never built that software before. They have a rework on it and rectify the mistake. Now, in order for this model to be successful, the team should know what they're building. This can help them design the software before they actually build it. Now, the third option is to ensure that the translation from requirement to the product will be perfect. It essentially means that the designers or people who are coding understand the requirements very well. In this scenario, did the designers or architects designing the system really understand what the user wanted? They can design the system correctly only after understanding it thoroughly. If they don't understand it, the design could be incorrect. Now, this can lead to build stage done incorrectly, testing might be incorrect, and so on. Now, it is highly imperative for this model to succeed so that everyone has a shared or correct understanding of what they're looking for. If you look at it from the predictive and adaptive scale, this model is very much a predictive model. This is because we don't start until our requirements are done, then move on to the design stage, hence the requirements should be made clear upfront. Now, let's discuss about the pros and cons of this model. Let's start with the pros. This model is pretty simple and easy to understand. Anybody can say that this is pretty straightforward, logical, and actually makes sense. Now, let's look at the second advantage. In case the requirement is fixed, it is a very predictive model as we know at the very beginning. What we need and then identify how long it is going to take. Now, once our design is ready, we know how long it is going to implement and so on. It also gives us predictability in terms of how many sources we need. We also have predictability of what we are going to get. This is a pretty good model from a predictive standpoint. And then last but not the least, this is an efficient process since we are aware of all the requirements. This helps us consider all aspects of the product, which helps us in designing it perfectly. Since we know what we are building, coding is pretty simple as well. It's a pretty effective and efficient process in all phases, and there's no need to do a lot of rework. It is therefore a very efficient process from that point of view. Now let's look at the cons. This model is not very efficient or effective and we change things around a lot. If we change anything, let's say we change our mind, instead of building it a certain way, we want to build it this way. If that is identified in the implementation phase, it becomes a costly affair. So it's not very efficient to make changes during the development phase. The end product of the waterfall method becomes another big bang. 
Hence, we cannot reap benefits of early release or obtaining value during the development process. So when to use this software? Now, if you're working on a predictable or repeatable project, the waterfall model is just the way to go. Thanks a lot for watching this particular video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for following along through the entire video series and welcome to this lecture. Now in this lecture, let's learn about the V model. In a software industry, when we use a waterfall method, we compress the testing phase when there's a time crutch at the end. Also, we try to get through that phase really quickly as the deadline is emerging and the software needs to be deployed. So this model was designed to solve that particular problem. When we see the V model, it looks similar to the waterfall method, but it has a V shape. However, if you look closely, the model's left side is about the project definition where it goes on becoming finer. We can see that from the concept, we go to the requirement, then the design, and then the implementation. On the right side, it shows all the steps of validation, which correspond to the steps on the left. For instance, the verification and validation correspond to the requirement phase. Now in the we model, when we do our requirements, we talk about the verification and validation. We may talk about how we shall do the verification and validation and where we are in the requirement phase. Basically, we introduce the testing activities related to the testing phase earlier in the model. So we see here on the y-axis that when we go from bottom to top, it's increasing in the abstraction. And then if we go from left to right, it shows the completion timeline of the project. Now, the basic idea of the me model is that there's a lot of emphasis on validation earlier in the process. When we look at it from a predictive and an adaptive scale, we can say that the we model is a predictive model because it does not allow any type of feedback or it doesn't allow any type of changes during the phases. It just allows the verification to be introduced earlier in the process. So let us look at the advantages and disadvantages of this model. When it comes to the advantages of this model, it allows for an early detection of potential defects and the problems themselves. Now, for instance, if you consider the requirement phase, we can figure out how to validate and also measure correctness through this model. Then as far as the disadvantages are concerned, it needs more primary research because during the requirement process, we also talk about the validation of those requirements. So it is kind of extra work. So we can use this model if the requirements are ambiguous and also when you want a kind of early validation. That would help, then we can actually use the we model. So that's all for this particular lecture. Thanks a lot for logging in, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for following along to this entire series and welcome to this lecture. Now in this lecture, let us discuss about the Sashimi model. The concept of this model is to allow the different phases of the software development lifecycle to overlap. For instance, when we work on the requirements, rather than waiting for the requirement phase to be completed, we can start with the design while the requirements are still being created. Basically, we may think that when the requirements are not being done, how is it possible to start with the design, right? So when we do the requirements, we build the requirements for part of the application. And once those requirements are ready, the architects or designers can start working on the requirements that have already been created. In this way, the different phases of the Sashimi model can be overlapped. Similarly, when the part of the application is designed, the implementation phase can be started and so on. So the basic concept of this phase is that the next phase will not have to wait until the previous phase starts. There's no need to wait until the previous phase is completed in order to start our current phase. Now in this model, the phase can be overlapped such that we can overlap more than just one phase. In this scenario, at the point where we see the red line, we have got the requirements going on, followed by the design, the implementation, and also we have some testing at the end. We may have less overlap or more overlap, depending on what works for the particular team working on it. Now, let us see where it stands in terms of the predictive and adaptive scale. This may be not 100% predictive. While we're working on the requirements, if you start designing and learn something, the requirements can still be fixed. As we work on it, there's a scope of adaptability. Now, this has a bit of an adaptive approach, but it's still mainly a predictive model. Now, in terms of advantages and disadvantages, this model could be useful if you want to shorten the development time. Since we overlap these layers or phases, so it is shown here symbolically that a 12-month project could be completed in nine months if we overlap some of these layers. Now, one more advantage of this approach is the people of different skills may start working on a project without waiting for the work done in the previous phase that requires a different scale. In this situation, the architect may start working on the project before the person who is doing the requirements which are done. Now, the main benefit of this model is that we can do an early learning spike sometime. In the line that we see, we have got our architects available and the developers are ready as well. 
So we want to do a small spike to learn about something in particular during the requirement phase. We can build something small and test it during the requirement phase. And it helps us to do some spikes during this phase itself. Now, as far as the disadvantages of this model are concerned, it could result in some rework since we started the design before all the requirements were done. It means that if you notice anything later, we might have to adjust our design during the requirement phase. But if you already started to code, the change in the requirement may also result in some rework. So this is the disadvantage of this particular model. So this model can be potentially used if you want to reduce the time scale or if you have all the resources available and want them to get started on the project soon. Then this model can be used to overlap. So that's all for this particular lecture. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last few videos and welcome to this session. Now in this session, we'll discuss the incremental model. In the incremental model, instead of constructing the whole application in one time, we will build it in increments. For this particular increment, we can use the waterfall slabs. For the respected part of the application, we will be processing the requirements, design, implementation, testing, and deployment. Now, if this incrementation is successful for the user, then we can possibly deploy it and the user can utilize it. Now, after the first increment is prepared, then we can start with the second increment. After the completion of the second increment, we can begin with the third and so on. We can also overlap these various increments. Now, during the process of testing the first increment, we have started the requirements phase in the second increment at the same time. Then we have started the requirement phase in the increment N. When the increment is completed or the testing phase has to be started, we can also overlap these models and for each of the increments, we can use various models. For instance, let's say for increment one, we can use the sashimi model. Then for this increment two, we could use a waterfall model and we could have used another model for this increment N. So for each of these increments, we can easily use the different model. Now, in terms of predictive and adaptive scale, depends on how many overlaps are there. Then to apply one increment for another increment, need to check how much feedback is there. Now for the predictive model, we don't need to apply any feedback from one increment to another increment. For the adaptive model, we can apply the feedback from one increment to another increment. It will also check how many different layer overlaps will impact. Therefore, it will have a high range effect between the predictive and adaptive model. Now going ahead to pros and cons for the incremental model, if you check the pros for this model, in case if the value is delivered earlier, then the increment will deliver the value to the customer. For instance, if you're constructing a car, first we will build tires. It might not be useful if we build part of the application which are useful for the users, then the value can be delivered much earlier. Now the second benefit of this model says we can take the feedback from one increment. Then for the future increment, we can apply that feedback. The cons in the model were reserved in a rework. Now, if you begin the process of the requirement for the future increment without knowing all the requirements up front, then it may end up processing additional work in increment two or three or future increments. Now, since in the earlier part, we didn't know the list of requirements which was needed, it might be expensive for carrying out any required changes in the model. Now, these are all the cons for the incremental model. Now, where can we actually use this model? Now, as part of the application or product, if the organization benefits from earlier delivery, then this model can be used. It can also be used for applying the feedback from one increment to the future increments in a series of N. So the model has several other variations. So one of the variations we can say in one phase is that we could process all requirements simultaneously. Thereby in one shot, we will understand all the requirements and don't need to carry out in each phase. This process will make the model predictive and reduce the rework. In this case, we will be carrying out all the requirements needed in front then for each increment, we will do the design, implementation, testing, and deployment individually. In the other version, we can carry out the requirements in one shot. Then we carry out the overall design of the system from the implementation to the deployment is the only part we actually increment. So this will be carried out from design. Then part of it gets implemented, tested, and eventually deployed. This process will complete the increment completely. So therefore, in the increment, these three variations can be done simultaneously. Thanks a lot for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Now in this session, we will learn about unified process and its variants. If you look at the waterfall model, it is one of the most popular models that exists in the current industry. This model looks different from other models, you can see it in this picture. It is divided into two axes or two dimensions. The top one or the X axis defines certain phase or steps like inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. 
and then the software development process, which comprises recruitments, and then the software development process, which comprises requirements, analysis, design, implementation, and test can be seen on the y-axis. Now, these areas basically defines how much effort you put regarding business modeling in the inception phase. For example, in the elaboration phase, you spend quite a bit of time or effort on requirements, and then you would do a lot of analysis and design, but that but not that much of testing or implementation. While you get into the construction phase, you put a lot of effort on implementation, but not that much on requirements. So the area shows how much effort you put for that particular process in the step. You can also notice that each of these steps are divided into multiple iterations. Now, you can see in this diagram, elaboration has been divided into two iterations. A project may be divided into more than two iterations, but here even a step is conducted or done in multiple iterations. So we have a checkpoint to learn if we're going in the right direction. This enables us to check if we need to pivot or do anything different. The construction, as you can see, is divided into four iterations. And then the transition is divided into two iterations. Let us look at each of these phases now. We will start with inception. Now, in the inception phase, there is more focus on the business modeling and the requirements. It is the shortest of all the phases. If it is not short, it means you're doing a lot of planning, which confronts the very purpose of this model. First of all, what happens in this phase is that you establish the business case, you decide whether what you're trying to do to really make sense. You also define the scope in which the project will be operated. And then you do your feasibility study in terms of market, organization's ability to execute. You also do build versus buy analysis, where you would decide whether it's better to build yourselves or should you just get it off the shelf. So this is another thing that you discuss in the inception phase. Now, at the end of these, although you don't have all the requirements in design, you have some idea about the project. You get some kind of preliminary schedule and idea of the cost of the project to move forward. At the end of this phase, you have this milestone called lifestyle objective, which means the organization is committed to the objective of this project. The next phase is the elaboration phase. In this phase, a lot of activities happen around the requirements. A lot of requirements are captured in terms of use case. Now, the use case descriptions happen in this. There are two goals in this phase. The first one deals with risks. A lot of emphasis is given on what can go wrong and how we can resolve them. The second goal deals with validating the system architecture or how we would build a system. Now, one of the concepts is this executable architecture baseline. This means you build the core components of the system, which demonstrate that the system will work. So you build this executable architecture that defines at a concept level how it's going to work. So once you do this, you will have a better idea of the project and you can get a credible construction estimate for the next phase. Now, at the end of the elaboration phase, you have a milestone called lifestyle architecture, which means you have committed to the system approach for this project. Next one is the construction phase, which is the largest phase. In this phase, you're actually building the software. You can see that it's divided into multiple iterations, and each of these iterations results in a release, and you get some kind of feedback at every stage. It is highly iterative and an incremental methodology. So you may build part of the application in one iteration, then part of the product in another one or you could enhance or replace the current version with another one in the next iteration and so on. So you could do either iterative incremental or both. Now at the end of all the iterations of the construction phase, you have this milestone of initial operational capability, which means it is ready to be operationalized. This is the end of the construction phase. Now the last phase is the transition phase. In this phase, you do the final deployment of the software. You get the feedback from your users. If needed, migration of old system to new system might be done, or you may need to do any kind of training. So these kind of deployments or operationalizing practices or activities happen in the transition phase. Now, we will talk about some of the characteristics of this model. The first one is, although it is called a unified process, it's not really a well-defined process. It is a framework, but you can use other models such as part of this framework. For example, during the construction phase, you could use Azure, Sashimi model, incremental model. Similarly, during elaboration, you can use any of those models as well. So it is a framework and not really a defined process. The second one is, it signifies that every step requires all the software processes, such as design, implementation, test. In other words, you might need all of these in all the incremental phases. However, the relative emphasis and effort might be different during different phases. The third one is, it is very, very architecturally centric. As you noticed, during the elaboration phase, we spent plenty of effort on the architecture. Now, one of the two goals was to ensure that we have the executable architecture. So that model allows it to build reusing quality back into the system. The next one, it is a very, very use case centric scenario. That means when we do the elaboration, we consider a user into the picture. You can see here a use case diagram and a use case description. Now in a use case, 
Here's what a user wants. So a customer may want to do this, this, and this. For each of these use cases, you define the trigger point. How does that use case look, the exceptions, the extensions, and the variations of the use case? So you need to look not just from a system perspective, but from a user perspective to get a holistic view of the system. The next one is focus on risk mitigation. Now, one of the goals of elaboration phase was to identify and resolve risk. This is one of the key ideas behind this framework. Now, we will do a summary of the unified process. I would say that there is very much into the adaptive side rather than the predictive side. In terms of pros, it is a very adaptive process. During the construction phase or inception phase or elaboration phase, you can just adjust quite a bit. Now, you have seen that during the elaboration phase, we created the executable architecture framework, which supports the quality of the software and helps in the reuse of a lot of work that you do. And again, in the elaboration phase, you do not have risk mitigation, which increases the chance of success of your software. And it is possible to incorporate other software development models. These are some of the advantages. Now, in terms of cons, it is not a very straightforward process. There are a lot of steps, iterations. So it is a complicated process, and this results in the use of more resources. Now, this framework would really help if you have a bigger project. If the requirements are not known at the early stage of the project, you can use this because it allows flexibility during the construction phase and other phases. And if you would like to deliver the value early, then as soon as the construction cycle begins, you can deliver something after C1, then after C2, and so on. So if there are some of your constraints or desires, then unified process would be an example. What we discussed was one of the core of unified process. However, there are a lot of other variants. One of the most popular one which made unified process very common is the rational unified process, also known as RUP. In addition to what we just discussed, it defines nine disciplines, six best practices, and IBM has a tool called rational unified process tool. Then we have enterprise unified process that adds further disciplines and best practices. And then we have lighter versions of unified process, which actually make it simpler. Open unified process is a lighter version. Then the last one is the agile unified process, which is also a lighter version, but very much focused on the agile mindset and principles. So these are the variants of the unified process. Thanks a lot for watching this particular video. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last video and welcome to the next one. Now in this session on spiral model, we're gonna take a very different approach to software development. Now this is a risk driven approach as you will see. So let us see what this looks like. So when you first see it, whatever we have seen till now is linear or two dimensional, but this one is cyclic. So we go around in cycles and keep improving or iterating. So it's a cyclic process and each of these cycles actually has four basic steps. The first step is to determine the objective, what we wanna achieve in that particular cycle, then identifying and resolving risks, then we develop based on what we need for our objectives and then we plan for next iteration. So we can say that this is the basic idea behind each of these cycles. Now, if you see this diagram, you could be overwhelmed with so many steps and so many things to do, but not every single step or activity has to be performed. It is basically just an idea as you will see later, it's just a concept. But then, depending on the project or the product that you're working on, you select what to do and not to do and maybe do something different. But typically you do these four steps and then go in a cyclic manner and try to minimize the risks as you complete more cycles. Now let's look at these steps in detail. The first one is the determination of objectives. We define the exact objectives for this cycle after having a discussion with all the stakeholders. At the same time, we also define the constraints present to achieve those objectives in that cycle. Any kind of constraints could be industry specific like meeting certain regulations, or it could be a cost or time constraints. Any constraints we want to put up meet these objectives will be defined in step number one. Also, we state the possible alternatives available to achieve our objectives. So those are the things that we include in step number one. Now, the next step is identifying and resolving risk. So the primary focus of this step is the risk, what can go wrong. Not only just identification, but then find ways to mitigate or do something about those risks. We could be building a prototype or an operational prototype, or we might be doing surveys or whatever we need to do or some research. So we try to identify what other things could go wrong, and then we try to resolve what we can. Then comes step number three, where the actual work to meet the objectives is done. So if you're doing a feasibility study, then we do our feasibility study. Or if you're doing requirements, then we write those and so on. Now, if you're doing actual development, then we go through the design code integration and the result. So whatever is the objective of that cycle, the work needed to be done to achieve that objective is actually done here. Now, the final step is to plan the next iteration. 
this is the step where the work done in this cycle is, and then we say if we should continue or not continue. And if we want to continue, then we decide what the goal for the next iteration will be. We can say a commitment for moving forward will be done in this step. After this, we just begin with the next cycle. So we just keep on cycling backwards into this spiral. You must be wondering about how do you really track progress? Do we just keep on going around and keep repeating this process? Actually, three milestones are defined for us. You can quit at any time, but if you need to track the progress on a spiral project, these three milestones can be used. The first one is a life cycle objective, where we have the sufficient definition of technical and management approach. So we know exactly what it is and that we are trying to do and what exactly needs to be done. As long as the commitment or the consensus is present on the objective, then the goal is achieved or the milestone is achieved. Now the next milestone is the lifestyle architecture, where we have sufficient definition of the approach that we're gonna take so that all the risks will be eliminated or mitigated. So after achieving that, you can say the milestone has been reached. Now the third and the last one is the initial operational capability, where there is a sufficient operation of the software site and users, operators and maintainers are available to release the software to the team or the market or to your users, wherever it needs to be released at that given point in time. So that's when the third milestone is achieved. Now, let me tell you some of the characteristics of this particular model. This model emphasizes a lot on the risks. The primary steps of this process are identifying and resolving risk. The next one is that the efforts and the details are driven by the risk. So let's say if your main goal is to validate something, validate a concept or feasibility of it, and you're doing some kind of prototype or some kind of software development activity, now, you don't have to go through a rigorous requirements document or a very detailed document. You need to just do enough to achieve the goal or objective. So again, based on how much the risk, you put effort in terms of resolving the risk as well as in the development and test stage. Now, whatever you're trying to do based on the risks, you determine how much effort you're willing to put or going to put. Now, one more attribute of this model is that it's not really very well defined or it's not really like a step-by-step -step process, but it is a process model generator. So we actually use other models where appropriate to execute. So for example, in the development and test approach, we might be using a waterfall or we might be using any of these software development models to execute. And in a similar way, in other phases, we could be using some other techniques. So this is a process model generator and not really a process itself. Now, let's do a quick summary. It was first described in 1980 and 1986 by Barry Bohim as a process model generator. It's risk-driven, and there are four basic activities in every cycle. The level of effort and degree of details are determined by the risk. Remember that not every activity in the diagram requires to be performed. So with respect to the cycles, is it predictive or adaptive? I will possibly say it's adaptive because in every cycle we look at what we have done and then we can adapt to what is the next goal or do we want to achieve next? So this falls very much on the adaptive side of things. Now in terms of advantages and disadvantages, like I said, it's very adaptive. In every cycle, we can change the direction of where we are going. The chance of success of the product is increased by the focus on the risk. Then there is this flexibility of using any software development model. It also minimizes waste as it talks about, you know, how we don't need to go through all these single steps in the same rigor, but depending on the risk, we define how much effort we want to put. Also, there's this option of go, no go in every cycle and move forward. So it kind of allows us that checking on a regular basis to ensure that we will still get the return on investment that we were actually hoping to get. Now, let's take a look at the cons. This is a very, very complicated model, so it's definitely expensive to manage. The stakeholder engagement is needed after every cycle or during every cycle. So you need to do a lot of engagement from your key stakeholders. You need a lot of involvement. So where all can this model actually be used? It can be used in a very large high-risk project. The spiral model fits very, very well for these kind of high risk, high scale, very large scale projects. So we reached the end of this particular session. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to the next one. Now in this session, we shall learn about a concept which we will see in an organization if they're primarily doing waterfall methods. This concept allows organizations to give opportunity for leaders or opportunity in the middle of the project to see if you want to continue or not. So it provides this opportunity for the organization to review the progress and check if you want to continue. What does it really look like? It can be applied to any software development process. Let's say this was a kind of software development process. So once we apply the stage gates or sometimes called phase gates, 
we apply these checkpoints into different parts or different points of our software development process. For instance, in our case, even before we get into the requirements phase, we have a gate where organizations may want to validate what we're attempting to do. Does it even align with their strategies? In the first gate, if it's not aligned, we drop the idea and so on. So we can do it similarly. After we match the requirements, we can again assess and see if we want to continue. And on each of these phases, if we don't want to go ahead and then that idea is scanned or we don't want to continue anymore and it goes into a trash can. So that's the fundamental idea behind the stage gates or phase gates. So what do we really check at these gates? Now, there are three things. First, we check the quality of execution in the previous step. Whatever we had planned to do in the previous step, was it done? And what was the outcome of it? How well was it done? Next one is based on what we had learned as part of the previous step, whether it still makes sense to continue with this project, which will be the second question we ask. And the third is, if it makes sense to continue, do we have the action plan for the next step, which is reasonable and sound? And what will be the deliverables or what are we supposed to do in the next steps? These are the three things that we discuss in each of these gates. Next, what's the structure or elements of this gate process? When it comes to input to this process, is the deliverables of the previous phase and maybe some plan for the next phase. So the deliverables and all those things get into the gate. Then we have something called a criteria, which is basically questions or the metrics on which the project is judged. Based on the organization, we set this criteria so that when a project team goes to a gate check, they will be knowing exactly what to expect. Then after the criteria is applied at the end of the gate, processed or the gate checked or the stage gates, we get the results of the gate review process, which could be a decision whether to go ahead or to end the project or to hold the project, which might be due to the funds or maybe due to something else coming up, which is of higher priority. So the organization might say that this is a good idea, but we want to hold on to it right now, or it might be recycled. The idea where it might be moved or merged with another project, or we might just completely start a new project with a totally different view or perspective. So we might be recycling the idea. Now, another thing that we get out of the gate process is approved action plan for the next gate. During the gate process, they also review our next plan and approve it. And the last thing is the list of deliverables and date for the next gate, which include what to be done in the next phase and what will be the date for it. Now, those are the gate structure and elements. Let's now take an example, like how we could apply this phase gate or stage gate concept in some of the models we have learned. Let's have a look at waterfall model. In the waterfall model, as said earlier, every organization will do it differently. But in this example, we might replace this. Going from requirement design, we might put a gate in between these two. To say we are going to check after requirements, come together as a team, review, and see if we want to continue. Similarly, after design, we might learn a lot of things. It completely makes sense to put another gate there and say, do we really continue? Although we have invested so much. But do we continue with the development and the testing and so on? And after testing it, is it ready for deployment? We could do another test and so on. So based on the results, does it really actually make sense to continue? But as I said earlier, any organization will customize it to their needs. If you look at the incremental model, one of the variations of the incremental model can be just replace this with the gates. We can replace between design and implementation with a gate. And then after every increment, we could potentially put a stage gate there. That should we continue with the next increment or did we achieve our goal? Should we stop? or continue and so on. So we can apply these gates at different places. Now, if you look at the unified process that has an inbuilt gate check after every iteration, as seen on the screen after inception, we can do it then after every iteration of the elaboration. We can do a state check or gate check. Similarly, we can do that after each of these iterations. And it's pretty straightforward in terms of applying this technique to the unified process. Later, when we look at the spiral, the step four has the inbuilt feature or what we can say expectation to check whether to continue the next cycle or not. So it has this inbuilt checkout project, whether it's still in the business case, should we continue or not. Let us now see some of the pros and cons of this approach. Now, one of the pros is that it allows organization to reject poorer projects. It's that if the poorer project or something which does not return investment, return on investment will be not good on that project. So it could be quickly rejected by this process. And then because of this process, if you do our cost and physical analysis, it provides us some quantitative information about feasibility of the project. It also provides opportunity to validate our business case regularly. Now, when it comes to cons, it has a potential for restricting the creativity and innovation of the team as they're dependent on this third steering committee to let their idea go forward. Hence, by providing the structure, it just kills this innovation or the idea of creativity or the desire to continue to innovate. So let's just quickly summarize. Phase gate or stage gate is a technique to provide opportunity to reflect on current progress and decide if we must change the direction or should we continue what we are doing or terminate it or put it on hold. And then the organization generally customizes the gates to their needs. So if you're in an organization, we will have different terms and different ways to implement this. 
But the fundamental idea is to provide checkpoints in the various parts of our software development cycle so that we know we are going in the right direction. Now, those are the most important things regarding phase gate or stage gates. We're going to learn a lot more in more sessions to come. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching all the videos till now. Thanks a lot for logging on to Tech Academy. My name is Beam, and it's been a pleasure doing these lectures with you. So in the previous sessions, we learned about different software development models like waterfall, incremental, iterative, agile, lean, and so on. Now we mainly learned about their key information, features, pros, cons, and where to use these models. So to crystallize our learning about the application of these models, let us consider a few examples. Now these examples or scenarios are all fictitious, and let us analyze and decide which model would sync in each of the situation. So let's go ahead. First example, a very simple one. There's a solution company, company A, that basically is involved in installing a particular finance management system with big retailers. Company A needs to install a well-known finance management system at a retailer's headquarter, and company has even delivered the solution to several big retailers before. So which model would fit in best in this kind of situation? Now, if you analyze the situation, it's a well-known problem, and even the solution is known to the company as it has been implemented many times. Hence, where the problem and solution is well-known to the company, the model will fit perfectly. That would be the waterfall model. We can use the waterfall model here from which we can get all the requirements. Framework of design, implementation, testing, deployment, and maintenance. We can use this as a simple model. Now, another model we can potentially use is the sashimi model, where we can start capturing the requirements, organizing and designing at the same time. It is squeezed, then the waterfall model, but will work perfectly. So if you have the need to deliver the solution quickly, then we can also use the sashimi model. Now, one more model we can use here is the V model. This model is used when we don't have adequate time for the testing, which subsequently results into bad implementation of the solution and also creating a bad reputation. In such cases, we can use the V model where we start with the design and parallelly, we can start to capture the test and validate the implementation. V model would be perfectly fit for this kind of situation. Now, we can choose any of the given models based on the given situation. So that's example one. So let's look at another example. Now there's a large supply management company where branches are spread all over the world. The company wants to automate their process to reduce their cost. They've hired a company that is expert in this area and has done similar automation for supply management companies, but not at that large a scale. They have done it, but not as big as this company needs it to be. Now the supply management company wants consistency with their software all across the globe and wants to keep the software customizable as there exists different cultures in different parts of the world. Now, to capture the benefits early, they want the software to be deployed immediately in some parts of the world. So that's the brief about the example. Now, let us analyze and decide which model will fit in best for the situation. If we do the analysis, it is a fairly known problem and solution to the consulting company as they have handled it before. Even the solution is known, except that they haven't handled at such a large scale. So it's better to start off with something small and then proceed to implement all over the world. The supply management company will benefit from a phase delivery. So it's better to construct the model in a phased manner, and then we can improve the model based on the early iterations. Also, they want consistency, right? So we should design the system in such a way that it stays consistent as and when we deploy the model in different locations of the world. So the model that satisfies all our conditions and fits best for the situation is the incremental model. In this approach, we will plan out all the requirements and design upfront so that it will provide us consistency. This model provides us good consistency because we will consider all the requirements upfront from all the places and then we do the design so that we know that the design is going to work in most of the places. Now, since it's incremental, we can also get the benefit of first delivery. We can first try it out in South Asia and proceed to other locations of the world. Now, since we haven't done it at this large scale, doing it in increments will allow them to improve the implementation in the next iteration. Now, if you learn something from the first increment, then we can tweak it in the next iteration. So in this situation, the best suitable approach would be incremental model approach. Now, let's look at another example. In this example, the Reserve Bank of India, or the RBI, has done a research and has recommended new technology or the capability that should be adopted by the banks to keep them protected from potential threat of the future. So RBI has done the study and also come up with a potential solution. The solution that they have come up with has never been attempted and no literature exists for such a system. It's fairly a new area that we need to create. It is even a big and complex system that can take decades to build with lots of loss of time to build this software. Now, developers at RBI have a vague idea about how to go with it and has no concrete plan for it. 
Now, there are a lot of constraints with this initiative as it can disrupt a lot of routine transactions of lots of banking customers. So there exists a lot of risk and also a lot of constraints. So let's try to analyze the situation and see which model fits in best in this case. So in this case, we have a fairly unknown needs and outcomes, right? So we don't know what outcome will be and what the real need is. We just have an idea. It's very, very risky, this project, because it's never been executed and we don't know what is going to be the potential outcome. So it's also carried out at a very large scale and potentially a very complex project. So looking at the constraints in the situation, in my opinion, the spiral model will be a good fit for the situation because in every cycle, we can reduce the risk towards the real outcome we want to achieve. We can terminate it at any point of time. It is also fairly flexible and allows us to do a lot of discovery and as and when we are deploying our solution. So I think the spiral model will be a good fit in this situation. Now, let's take another example. There's a big insurance company which has the crucial product for processing the medical authorizations in prior. Now, prior authorizations are something like we get an approval before we get our treatment. Now, product has been in use for many years and the organization mostly follows traditional project management system. Currently, they have several limitations as it was created many years ago and has not been updated with the current industry trends. It is not able to fulfill the functionalities expected by the client. So the organization wants to build a whole new system which will satisfy client needs and set up the organization for the future. So they want to build something that is not for immediate one or two years, but the architecture would support the future needs and also satisfy the current needs. Now, the potential developer team who is working on this has a fairly good domain knowledge as they have built the current system and knows the base technology they're going to use. But of course, there will still be a lot of new technology they will have to implement and the current system is fairly complex. So it involves a lot of different pieces and it won't be easy to migrate existing workload to the new system as there are so many people involved. Hence, the expected duration of this migration would be around two years. Now, it is relatively a complex project as it involves a lot of stakeholders, which requires a lot of training, change management, and stakeholder management in the project to be successful. So let us analyze and see which model will work for us perfectly here. So we have some unknowns and risks, like we have an idea of what we want to build, but it's also associated with some risks because we're going to replace the existing system with a new system. So there is risk, but it's also not like a totally new venture as the team has a good domain knowledge and critical expertise in the base layer. So it's a medium sized project that lasts about two years. It will require complex deployment and change management. So we need to have a very good rigor in our process. Now, architecture is the key to set up the organization for the future. So we will have to make sure that the design is not only designated for immediate use, but for long term use. Now, looking at the complexity and the number of stakeholders involved, it would be beneficial to roll this out incrementally to get some feedback and tweak the system as we go. And then most of the projects in the organization are managed using traditional approaches. So leaders prefer certainty, milestones, and solid plans. Looking at this, in my opinion, the unified process would be a good approach in this case. Now, during the inception phase, we can talk about a lot of things briefly. In the elaboration phase, we can decide about the executable architecture that we want to build to make sure that we are rebuilding a product for the future. So some of the known risks can actually be mitigated during that process. Now, during the construction phase, you can also iteratively build a new system and get the feedback to improve the system as necessary. During the transition phase, we can take care of a lot of the training and change management, and also we can start very early. Also, I think Agile will be equally suitable here, but we will have to add those extra things to make sure that the change management with others simultaneously. Now, even from the architecture point of view, we have to be careful about continuous refactoring and making sure we are building products for the future. I think both of these models are iterative models and allow a little bit of uncertainty to be dealt with basically during the entire process. Now they are change friendly. So I think both these two models would fit in this case. So I think all of you have got a pretty good understanding about the models with the above examples. Now, until we meet next time, enjoy iterating between the different models. Go ahead and break some stuff, try out, experiment, and leave your comments on the videos below. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon. Thanks a lot for watching the session so far and logging on its academy and welcome back to this session. Now, before getting into agile method, let us find out certain reasons that led to the emergence of the agile method. It makes a logical sense as we look at the waterfall method. We define what has to be designed, built and validated. Now, some challenges faced by software industry led to the emergence of the agile method. The first one was in the verification phase where all the components were put together and to find out whether the system meets the expectation, they noticed a lot of unexpected issues during that phase. Now, we may wonder about the problem caused. Was it not designed properly, nor 
did they have a look at the different components that might be the cause in some cases. But they found that software systems were very complex in nature themselves. Now, to predict the interaction of different components with each other and their behavior was very challenging. These defects were found very late on, further down in the process line. It was very expensive to fix as well. Now, another problem was the software being developed and installed as the user started using the system. It did not meet their expectation, nor did it work out the way they planned. Now, the client started commenting about their money invested and time spent in building the software and not getting the predicted result. So did we do a good job in the requirement phase? As we did not spend enough time on it. So we did not spend enough time basis, but software industry found that predicting user requirements was very difficult. User wanted something like this kind of thing, but he assumed they actually needed something else. Now comes the translation problems. As the architect or designer thinks the user required this, they interpreted the requirements wrongly. Now the developer looks at it and comments as it does not make sense. They probably require something else. Now, as we can see, the user required something else and we built something totally different. Others cause for this problem could be the market shift. Now, during listing the requirements, the needs were correctly identified according to the user need. On the other hand, by the long run of software development after development, the market was shifted and the user does not require this anymore. The problem is that we're discovering it very late, which makes it difficult to fix or very expensive to fix as well. Now, as the industry found these issues, several teams and leaders tried different methods like Crystal, XP, Scrum, and they had some marginal amounts of success. Now, the vital idea behind most of this model was to reduce the learning cycle. How do you really learn faster? And to increase the collaboration between the team members. So as these teams and leaders started finding success in their methods, they thought to get together and find out what we all are really doing, which is common and actually making us all successful at our plans. So these 17 individuals came together on February 2001 in a ski resort and discussed about each of their methods and concluded what was commonly working in all of their favors and in their methods as well. The conclusion from the meeting was symbolic. The manifesto for agile software development consists of four values and 12 principles. They did not state a new model or a process, and they define an agile mindset, which helps teams to build better software. So that's it for this session, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome back. Now in this session, we're gonna study about Agile Manifesto. We many refer to it as the foundation of Agile. This Agile Manifesto has been written by 17 individuals. This manifesto contains four values and 12 principles. First, we shall begin with the values. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it as well. In this, we have some interesting words. Now before going further, we shall see what we exactly mean. Now the first word is uncovering. What does it even mean in here? This simply means that they're not done yet and still on the learning phase. Now, another interesting word is doing it. By the time when all the practitioners defined these values, they came out of the practice what they were used to do. In this way, they were used to download the software. They created these values totally from their experience. Next, we have the third word, which is helping others to do it and not saying it as not telling others to do it. We shall now proceed further. Now, after reading this manifesto or values, usually people get questions in their mind as this documentation has no value, or there shouldn't be any plan? Now, surely not. We shall continue with the manifesto, then it will become easier to understand. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left much more. Now, for the documentation and plan, these both will have the values. More than the documentation, we give value to the working software. Now, we will look at each value one by one, and we will try to understand them. Now, the first one is individual interactions over process and tools. This means during the time of any problem or when it's about to improve the process, we try to find an additional process that might help us. Or there are tools by which we can actually use to solve these. Now, this is simply not to focus only on the individuals and their interaction. Often, we don't give much time for the individuals and interactions. Next, we have the second value as working software over comprehensive documentation. Now, this doesn't really imply as we can do documentation, we will perform this documentation when the situation is critical or at the time of its need. Now, in the end, the customer gives much more importance to the working software, so the documentation doesn't have a lot of value to them at that point in time. For them, this can be done from our end, and it doesn't matter for the user. Now, customer collaboration or contract negotiation is our third value. Contract becomes essential as it builds the limits under which we must work and function. Along with the collaboration, we can build a better software by learning what the user requirements are. Now, the last and the fourth one is responding to change or following a plan. A plan is a must-required tool. Now, with the help of this plan, we can be on the same path. 
But welcoming the changes to create something which user doesn't require, we must not get tied in within the plan. That's it. These are the four values of the Agile Software Manifesto. Now, moving further, we will discuss about the principles. As we know, we have 12 principles here. The first one is our highest priority, is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. This gives an overview of how it is important to give attention on the customer values, that is, the working software itself. Now, welcome changing requirements even late in development. Agile process harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. This indicates that accept the change for the improvement. Now, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference of shorter time scale. This is to illustrate that a continual learning is the basic fundamental. Now, as we create something and display it to the customer, by this we can learn a lot of other things as well. Business people and developers must work together. This clearly speaks about the collaboration between the unusual. Now, this has to be done in order to form an effective and interactive understanding. Build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Now, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Now, as the word conversation, we can understand that it's about having interaction with the particular individuals. Next we have is the working software is a primary measure of progress. This is nothing but we can create planning documents and the requirements documents. With the help of working progress, we measure the progress and it's a primary measure. Now, according to this term, we will still have zero progress if we only do the requirements and design. Now, the agile process promotes sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Now, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. This portrayed that. Now, with the technical knowledge and looking after the design, we can help in building a system which can be changed easily or even can adopt that change down the line. Next, what we have is simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Eleventh one is the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. This says, working on investing or encouraging teams to work more on the software rather than working on other things. Now, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adapts its behavior accordingly. This is speaking all about the continuous improvement. Now, question we get a lot is, how does it solve the waterfall model problems that we actually saw earlier? Now, this will be divided into two as we go through the principles. One is completely talks about the adaptive nature of software development, as in here we can create and learn something. Collaboration is the other thing. Now, as the first one helps in identifying the translation problems early, this is due to the fact that we are building it quickly. We will also display it to the user to get the information. If they didn't find anything that's relevant, they will report it back at that moment's notice only. By this, we can easily find out the translation problems at the earliest phase of the project and as we start integrating them back into our project at a much more faster pace. Now, the second one is around the people and interaction. This will help us detect translation issues early as we're working closely with our business. Here, the misunderstandings are clarified quickly. Every coin obviously has two sides and the door swings both ways. So Agile also brings new problems with it. Now let's see, what problems would Agile actually bring? Now the first one is, since we embrace the change and look at the part of the system to design then, sometimes the architecture, the design, and the database modeling is very challenging. There's always this change where we feel lack of control and there's a bit of unpredictability in what we are building. Now this makes leaders of the organization a little bit uncomfortable. So there is another one where the customer has to be involved throughout the process for continuous feedback. So they have to spend a lot more time on the system and not actually spend a lot more time actually designing the system. So that's all for this particular session. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome back to this one. Now, in this session, we're gonna discuss about the Agile frameworks. Now, remember, Agile is a mindset. We shall see how do you actually apply these mindsets on a software development process. Now, there are plenty of frameworks that are available out there. These frameworks are used to apply these Agile mindsets for our team and for our project. Now, there are no magic bullets in this, so we need to customize this framework to meet the necessities of our team, our project, or our organization. We must make sure that we stay true to the principles and the values of Agile and not get bogged down by the rituals or practices of a specific framework so as to maintain the key to customization. Now, we shall adopt some knowledge from some of these frameworks which are out there. One of the most common framework is the Scrum. This Scrum is based on the one to four week cycle. In this, we consider a part of our project where we do our define, our develop, and our design to test the software. So our product is incrementally developed. 
Now, the another popular one is the Kanban. This framework is based on a continuous flow model where we basically try to optimize our existing software development process. There's a combination of these two frameworks that's called Scrumban. In this combination framework, we're able to use Scrum as our primary framework, and then we use Kanban to optimize our flow within our sprint. Now, another popular framework that's pretty similar to Scrum is called XP, which is extremely programming. Now, this has most of the practices of Scrum. This also defines some engineering practices which are very crucial for an agile team. So there's the hybrid of a Scrum and XP. Now, there's another framework that's been quite popular recently. It's called as Lean Startup. This will help us in case if you have a lot of unpredictable market or industry, we really want to prove our solution before we actually implement it. So this Lean Startup helps us in that area, and there are many more. Now, quite frequently, the organizations actually end up customizing some of these frameworks to meet the need of their teams or their project or the organization. Now, as we previously discussed, we had to make sure that we stay true to the agile principles and practices. Also, we must not get bogged down by the rituals or practices of a specific framework. The Scrum is by far the most popular of all frameworks when compared in terms of the popularity. Now, around 70% of the agile teams use either Scrum or one of these variants. So this is how people usually equate Agile to Scrum, which is actually not really true. There are plenty of frameworks available out there and can be used for our Agile implementation as we please or as the situation demands. So that's all there is for this session. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one. In this session, we're going to discuss about one of the most popular frameworks to implement Agile mindset called Scrum. Now, let's keep Scrum next to a waterfall method just to understand the basic idea behind Scrum. Now, Scrum works on a one to four week sprint where you define, design, build, and test part of your product. Then it's shown to your stakeholders and check your product has to be adjusted or something different needs to be done. Now, we repeat this cycle. With this, the project is built incrementally after each sprint, and then at the end, you get your entire product. Now, in a waterfall method, when the requirement phase is done, you get a requirement document at the end of it. After that, the design phase. Now, at the end of that, you get some high-level design or low-level design documents. Now, we will have more design documents, and then you do your implementation verification after this deployment, and you get your finished product. Now, the waterfall method, there's one big batch. You get your final product, but in Scrum, every fortnight or between one to four weeks, you get the finished product, which are basically iterations of the first one. Now, you just keep adding to your existing product until you get your final product. So, this is basically briefly about Scrum. Now, let's get into some details about it. And basically, let's get into the one to four week sprints. Now, if a company wants to build a job website, like let's say, for example, monster.com, and they're planning to use the Scrum framework, there are basically three roles defined in Scrum. Now, the first one is going to be product owner, who defines what needs to be done and in what order. Then there's the Scrum master that helps the team to keep the Scrum values and principles. Now, the Scrum master will facilitate most of the meeting in the team. The Scrum Master will find the resolution of some of these roadblocks. Now, there's a team of developers and testers who organizes and builds most of the software. Now, let's check how the job website will be created using Scrum Framework. Now, the product will be discussed with the executives, the team, the stakeholders, clients, users, and will try to define what is needed to be built. Now, a product backlog will be created. That is the list of users which will be prioritized and defines what needs to be done. Now, the product backlog is very different than a typical requirements document. Here, the requirements document is at a very high level and can change over time. Now, a very high level actually means the first item will be to post a job and a company admin can post a job or a job seeker can apply for a job. At this level, the backlog can be defined and once the team is ready to sprint, they get together for a meeting called a sprint planning meeting now, where the whole team will participate. Now, here what they're going to do is they're going to pick the top stories on which they can work with the existing sprint. The product owner will review those stories with the team and clarifies the questions on them. The team gets together and then do a tasking of the stories to find what exactly has to be done to build a software. So in this case, it may be designing of this database. Some data should be filled on and tested on the database and create this UI screen. Now, once the team has looked at the stories, they have asked it out, uh, they can actually finish it in the next sprint or even in the current sprint. They will commit to the stories and finish it in the current sprint itself. Now starts the executions and the start sprint where everybody's working to implement the software. Now, the whole team will get together for daily standup during that sprint and discuss their work and see if there are any roadblocks. So in this case, our database person can say that the tables were created and designed yesterday, and today I'm going to populate it with some test data. So I needed some help here, or I don't have the permission of certain things in the database, and I cannot finish my job until I get that permission. Then he may get some help, like whom should he contact and get the access from? 
Now, these things keep going on in the sprint, but at the end, you will get your finished product. In this case, post a job and apply for a job, which is basically what the user on monster.com would see. Now, let's just pick these two stories and this will be done at the end of the sprint. Now, there are two other meetings that happen at the end of the sprint. The first one is called a sprint review where the team meets with the stakeholders, with the client, and demonstrates the finished product and takes the feedback. In this meeting, the stakeholders can give any additional ideas. Like he may say, let's tweak some of this functionality or take a look at the UI or anything like that. The second meeting will happen at the end and it's called a sprint retrospective. Here they discuss about process and not about the product, like how it can be improved or the feedback from the last sprint and its improvement. Now, the team members don't come on time for stand-up, then everyone's opinion won't really be there. So a reminder is sent five minutes before the meeting to be on time, and then we can finish this stand-up with everybody getting a chance to speak and share their opinion, which is really important. So to track sprint, we have to achieve our goal for the sprint. The team uses something called a burn down or burn up chart. This shows the amount of work left or the days of the sprint. We can have fair idea if you're going to make it or we won't be able to make it on time. And basically, where they need to focus and if they need any help. And these basically are all the key factors in the Scrum. Now, Scrum supports agile principles, as we've seen here. We're building iteratively and it embraces change. Now, change can be made to the product backlog after every sprint and product can be shifted to a different directions. It also supports a lot of meetings for collaboration, collaborations between the team members and the clients and a lot of opportunities too. So the sprint retrospective supports continuous improvement and so on. As seen here, it embodies the key principles of agile. Now, summary, there are three goals in Scrum. Scrum master, the team, and the product owner. Now, there are some rituals like sprint planning meeting, daily scrum meeting, sprint review, and a sprint retrospective. Some artifacts like product backlog, sprint backlog, and the brown darn chart are also really important and will always be there. Thanks a lot for watching this particular session. I'll see you in the next. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome to this one. Now in this session, we're gonna study about a technique, Kanban, which is a tradition that was taken from Toyota's production system, which helps a team enhance their software development process. Now let's understand what Kanban is. First, we need to put it next to a screen process to know how different it is. Now in Scrum, we work between one and four weeks iterations. In the first iteration, we take a part of the product, next we define it, design it, build it, and then finally test it. Now after testing, there will be a new product that will come out of it. Now, what do we do next is just continue the cycle until we are done. You will notice that the product changes over time. The style and the color also changes. Now, that has to reflect the adaptive nature of Scrum, which means that as we complete each of these cycles, we get feedback from the client and we may do necessary changes what we actually want to build. Now, in Kanban, there is no prescribed or fixed iterations or any new practices. Kanban consists of a set of properties and principles that help optimize software development process until it's in a continuous flow. So by continuous flow, I meant like things from the backlogs are moving through the software development pipeline and its finished product is coming out at the other end of the pipeline. Now, for instance, it goes in a series like first item got done, then the other item, then a couple of items. You will notice that this is also an adapter process. Whereas when things are getting completed, we can get feedback from the customer and when we feed it into the backlog, but at the end, we get the whole product. Now, Kanban typically then optimizes the software development pipeline by a set of principles and properties. Moving forward, we shall observe how these properties and principles play in a situation. Assuming a team has a process wherein the work item goes from backlog to the analysis, then develops, then test, and then to release. Now the team has been there to build a job website and which has these features. Applying Kanban to this situation, the first property of Kanban is to visualize your workflow. Now to visualize the workflow, you basically create a visual storyboard. It can be an electronic or it could be a physical board. And you move all your columns or all your states or all your steps of your process into one column. Now, if you check in some columns, you notice remarks doing and done. That means if the item is being processed or being analyzed, then it will be in the doing column. If it is done, then you will move it to the done sub column. Now, once we create this board, then as we work on each of these items, for instance, the team is working on post a new job. The team will move the item to the analyze because they're doing the analysis. Now, once the analyzing is done, they will move it to analyze and so on. Now, once the work is completed, the work item is moved on the board to represent where each of these items is. After a few days, let's see what the board is going to look like. Now, if you notice the test column on the board, there's a lot of items that are pending. Now, if any action is not taken immediately, then the items in the test column will pile up and will become a bottleneck and it will slow down the delivery. So how do you really solve this problem? Kanban supports another property called limit work in progress. 
Kanban allows us to define what's the maximum number of items that can stay in that state. In this case, in the analyze state, we can have only one item, and in the develop state, we can have only three items. So far in the analyze state and in the develop state, we are safe because we have only one in analyze and we have two in the develop. But then when we look at the test, the limit set is two, so we have four items, which is not good. So the team had a WIP or work in progress limit and we're following it, then the situation wouldn't have arise. So let's apply Kanban property and see how this flow would be. Now, if this ended on the 10th day, the board would look something like this. The developer just got done with the make payment and wants to pick another item from analyze. Now, can we move update job into the develop column? No, because the number of items in develop are only three and the WIP limit is three. So the WIP limit calculates both doing and the done at the same time. So we cannot move update job. Now, another alternative is move the make payment and log it into the test as they are done. But this can be done because the test column also has a WIP limit of two and there's already two cards over there. Now, in such a situation, what will the developers do? If there are too many bugs, the developer can fix it or if a resource issue, then you can help test one of these things and move it. Now, in the above case, sign up was done and then we will move it to release. The test column has only one. So now we can move the login into the test column. The developer can move the update job into the doing column and they can work on it. Finally, we sorted out the flow issue by collaboration and working with each other. Now, in a temporary situation, this is perfectly fine. But if it happens again and again, then we need to manage the flow. Now, if it's a permanent resource issue, then you can add more people to the test or if it's a buggy code. Now, the question arises. What should be done in the development so that we don't have as many defects and then it moves a little bit faster? So whatever you do, but you try to manage your flow. Now, this board will work good only if team members are moving the card from one state to another state consistently. But each one may have different understanding of the policies of when to move or not. So Kanban suggests another property called make process policies explicit, wherein we define exactly what are the policies that the team will follow. Now, one solution could be the definition of done for each of the states. Now, the definition of done would be what can I move and when can I move? When is something done? For the analyze phase, when the update resume is done well, when we have requirements defined or whatever we need to be done for that story to move from doing to done, similarly, it's going to be in the develop state. So that gives a very clear understanding to the team members as to when they can move items from one state to another state. Now, we just went through some of the core properties of Kanban, but there are a couple more principles and properties that are defined in Kanban. So Kanban defines three principles and five properties. We already talked about the four properties and now we shall speak about the principles and the properties. Now, the first principle is start with what you know. In reality, we really didn't create a whole new process. We just explained the current process. So this is the yellow part in the video, which was marked in the script. It says extra please check if required. So I'll start that now. So as we manage the flow, we're going to pursue incremental and evolutionary change. In this way, we can slowly find out where the roadblock is or where the bottleneck is. We will have to fix that and then respect the current process, roles, responsibility, and its titles. We chain it only when we find an issue with the current flow. And then one of the property is to improve collaboratively. Now to know the constraints and work process, people have to work collectively or collaboratively. If we understand what the process is and how it works, then we will be able to have a meaningful interaction and fix the issues in the flow. So that's Kanban. So thanks a lot for watching this video and thanks a lot for following along in this entire session. It's great having you. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks a lot for following along in the sessions and welcome back. Now, in our previous session, we had discussed a lot about why Agile and what is a manifesto and principles. We also discussed about Scrum, Kanban, and a few other techniques. Now, in this session, we will summarize the whole Agile and Lean concepts. We will also discuss about the methodologies and their fitting in with other models. Now, there are plenty of ways for implementing the Agile mindset. We can consider Agile as a mindset and not really a process, so that we can have plenty of different ways to implement that particular mindset. Now, this is an incremental and an iterative model. So we might be building incrementally as well as iteratively building a software. Now, this is useful for a very short development life cycle. In terms of predictive or the adaptive life scale, we would consider the agile is very much on the adaptive side. In terms of pros and cons, the agile and lean is very flexible to change. Now, this basically results in increasing the chance of building the right product as we're constantly looking and getting feedbacks. We're also pivoting based on the learning. Now, this interacts with the market so that we can quickly get a few things out in the market to beat out our competitor. So if there's a desire to beat the market, then Agile and Lean could be the way. Now, in terms of con, here we don't do all the requirements upfront or we don't do everything about what we're about to build. 
So we're architecting in certain ways and we start building. Now it might result in a rework as we don't know everything upfront. Since we are iteratively building it, we require very close collaboration with our clients and our users. Now we shall see where do we use Agile and Lean? What kind of use cases do we have? We use it where the requirements may change. So for instance, if we think that the requirements may change over time, then this Agile and Lean would be a good fit. Or if you're playing with a technology that is unknown, unproven, or we haven't used the technology, then there could be a lot of learning involved. So in both cases, the Agile and Lean will be a good fit when there's learning involved during that development process. That's it for this particular session. Thanks a lot for logging in. Leave your comments and questions, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching the last session and welcome back to this course. Now in this lesson, we should learn about a concept known as Lean Startup and how it provides a very unique insight into software development. Now the basic thought process behind this approach is simple. How can we quickly gain knowledge about our market or user need? There are a lot of software development models in the market which focus on the delivery of the software. Now this model is slightly different as it emphasizes a lot on understanding or fast learning about the real user need. Now let's see what it's like. The Lean Startup model or Lean Startup concept became popular with the book by Eric Ries, which is called the Lean Startup. It was initially aimed at the startup companies. Although it's been used by several industries, the concept is still pretty popular in the software industry. As we can see, the model is pretty straightforward. It's basically a cycle of build, measure, and learn. The cycle keeps repeating. This was the basic thought process behind software development. However, what makes it really powerful are a couple of concepts that should be highlighted. The first one is what Eric Ries says about validated learning. This is what Eric says. We must learn what customers really want, not what they say they want or what we think they should want. We must discover whether we are on a path that will lead to growing a sustainable business. So what he's basically talking about here is validated learning. We can learn things by asking someone. We can just say, hey, I'm planning to build this functionality. Would you use it? People might say, yeah, sure, we will use it. However, what Eric is actually talking about is validated learning. This is where we actually aggregate data and check if anybody will use our feature or functionality that we are building. Hence, concept number one is validated learning. Now, the other idea talks about completing the cycle as quickly as possible. If it's all about time, how quickly can the cycle be done so that we can iterate over it and reduce waste or reach our market in a faster way? Now, the third way is to think about the lean startup concept itself. Whenever there is an idea that we want to build or something new that should be launched on a lot of occasions, there are assumptions that model has to be true in order for the model to be successful. Hence, when it comes to lean startup concept, we think about those assumptions and then decide what metric, what can I measure to validate or invalidate my assumptions. Now, once we have that metric, we think in terms of experiments that we can give or do. Now, red color is used intentionally to say that it's just an experiment and not even a product. Hence, we do that experiment to get the metric. Now, this metric will then validate or invalidate our assumptions. We can then think about the next steps. Therefore, it has the concept of validated learning as we're doing an experiment and getting a metric. We're also doing it as fast as possible and ensuring that experiment doesn't take years to complete for us to learn about that particular metric. Now let's look at a couple of examples to better understand this concept. Now you may be aware of Zappos.com. It's a website that sells shoes online. When the founder of Zappos was thinking about this idea of selling shoes, he must have thought if people actually do buy shoes online. He wasn't so sure at that time and therefore didn't want to spend or invest too much money to create a warehouse of all the shoes and then begin selling. Instead, what he did was this. He went to a local store with his camera. He then took photographs of all the shoes in the store and then uploaded them on a website. He just made it an online store for people to buy. He then waited to see if people would actually buy it. He was pleasantly surprised when people ordered and brought shoes from his website. It became popular in no time at all. He then spoke about warehouses and different storage points. As we are aware, Zappos.com was acquired by Amazon. It is therefore a very successful venture. However, we can see how it began. Now let's just apply the lean startup model on this. When the founder was contemplating about building this online shoe store, he had an assumption about people buying shoes online, right? So he basically thought of a metric that can be used to measure and that can validate or invalidate his assumption. Hence, he thought if he knows about the number of shoes sold online, it would be a great metric. He then researched about the fastest way he can learn about this metric or collect this metric. He then created a website with shoe specs and waited to see if people would actually be interested in them. Now, as we can see, he started with an assumption. He then thought of a metric and did an experiment just to validate his assumption. Now, let's look at another example. You all must be aware of Dropbox, right? Now, the company that created Dropbox had a lot of technical people. They started with an assumption as well. 
Will people need a resource where they can share content or synchronize files into multiple devices? In this case as well, Dropbox did not build the product. They just made a video. This video basically spoke about how Dropbox works or what the users will experience if they were to build the functionality. At the bottom of the video, there was a link or a place for people to provide their email address so that they can be notified when this functionality is made available. Now, the makers of Dropbox were pleasantly surprised when they received tons of emails overnight. A lot of users were interested in this kind of functionality and wanted to give it a try. So Dropbox did execute it. And as we say, the rest is basically history, right? So it has since become a well-known brand in the industry. So let's apply our lean startup model here in this case. What are the assumptions? In this scenario, the assumption was people may need a functionality to sync files on multiple platforms. The metric they thought would need is a number of people who could sign up to make use of that particular service. Now, as an experiment, they created a video to show how it will work. They validated their assumption, then they made a pretty quick experiment to collect the data to validate their assumption. Now let's look at one more example. The third example talks about a company called Buffer. They basically allow you to share and schedule your content on social networks such as Twitter or Facebook. Now they were curious if people would be interested in such an idea. They didn't create video or a product. All they did was create a dummy page. The dummy page said, here's what our service will do. Are you interested? The next page said that they were working on it. You can write us an email and we'll get back to you. Now, after validating it, they did another experiment, which was centered on people actually paying for it to check if they basically created a page between these two. Now, the user says he was interested in it. It led to a page where they can select the payment plan that they like. So when they click on any payment plan, it says, OK, work is still in progress. We will get back to you. Please provide your email address. Hence, they did two rounds of validation of their assumptions. So let's apply the MLB model to check if it works. Now, the assumption in round one was, were people actually interested in doing this? Do they really want to schedule posting content on social media? The metric is basically the number of people who click on the link to show their interest. So the experiment was to create a dummy page to know how many people would be interested. Now, after completion of this cycle, there is another cycle of the same build, measure, and learn cycle. This is about people paying for the functionality. Now, the metric was number of people who click on the second page, which is the price plan. Hence, the experiment consisted of another page that shows the pricing plan and for people to actually select the pricing plan. Now, this was a two round process as well. Now, this is to ensure that we are on the right path for our product would be of some interest to some people. Now, once we realize that something is not going as per plan, we can drop this idea and start afresh. Hence, this lean startup concept acts as a quick guide with regard to users on our market. Now, one question would eventually pop up. All the examples we discussed so far were kind of for startup companies, right? But does it apply to a big industry as well? Fortunately, or whatever one may call it, I came across this situation when I was paying for a service. Now, in the last five years, the price or cost that I was paying for a service has almost doubled. Hence, I wanted to talk to the company's customer service and ask them the reason behind the doubling of service fee. Now, in order to do that, I wanted an invoice that has five years old and today's invoice. I wanted both invoices just to tell the customer service that the changes have almost doubled, right, in these five years. Now, when I visited their website, I saw a link. It showed me the current and last year invoices. However, there was a link to view older documents as well. So when I clicked on that link, it showed me a message which said, we are currently working on adding new features to the documents paid, such as adding multiple years of documentation, et cetera, et cetera. By clicking this link, you're giving us valuable data to determine the demand for the documents beyond two years. Thank you for helping us complete this announcement. A full functioning page will be available soon. Food for thought, right? So irrespective of whether they did it intentionally or not, this is clearly an idea or concept of a lean startup that big companies also use to ensure that they're working on the things that the user actually needs. So let's apply the model again. In this scenario, the assumption was a need to see old invoices. The metric would be the number of people who would click on the link to see the old invoices. The experiment was to create a dummy link in order to show the old invoices, right? So as we can infer, this is a concept that can be applied to a startup as well as a big company. Now, let's summarize. What is a lean startup all about? It is about validating the learning and completing the cycle as quickly as possible. It is basically an incremental and iterative approach. It does believe in the short and very short cycles. So if you think in terms of the predictive and adaptive cycles, it is very clear that it is very much on the adaptive side. So much so that it's on the negative side of the adaptive. And then it even goes beyond that. So in terms of pros and cons, it definitely helps us understand faster and build the right product. As far as speed to market is concerned, we can quickly go to the market by validating it. Now, when it comes to cons, there might be a rework. It also requires us to experiment iteratively with clients, not just with some proxy for users, but actual users. For the client, we experiment with them directly. Now, in the examples that we learned, there was a link. 
When somebody clicked on it, it just said we are still working on it. Hence, there is a slight risk that we are experimenting with our users and clients directly. So that's a risk that everyone's kind of willing to take. So where would you use this? If there is a doubtful business case, user need, or a high probability risk, this concept can be used. In case you're building a big product and not exactly sure about a specific feature, we can use this concept to validate it before putting too much effort and time into the feature. So that's all there is about Lean Startup. Go through this video a couple of times. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section. Love to answer them for you. Thank you. See you in the next session. Thanks a lot for watching these entire sessions with me week on week. It's been amazing having you guys on board. Love your comments and your questions. Now, in this last session, we learned about different software development models like waterfall, incremental, iterative models, agile, lean, all of these different kinds of models. We also discussed about the appearance of these particular models, key information for these models, pros and cons of these models, and the use of these models in real-time showcases. Now, to solidify the learning and to check in the given situation, we can apply this knowledge about these different models. So let's take a few examples, the imaginary ones, to check which models fit into these scenarios after analyzing the situations. So let's start with the first simple example. A retailer wants to start an online business on addition to the physical stores. He strongly believes he needed it as all the retailers have already started it, but he's not aware what all features will be needed to start with and what user experience to provide. And he wants to do it urgently because in the market, many users already have it. Now the stakeholder and the board members are also asking for the sound functionality to beat out the competition. So this is their first experience with e-commerce. Now the stakeholders who have the vision for this product would be driving the development of this online store. They will be very dedicated towards this and will collaborate with the development team. So to analyze the scenario and find out which model will be used. The analysis and recommendations. The company is very confident with the idea of what they are having for their online business. Now they need to iterate for the following reasons. Speed to market, which means they wanna do it very quickly. Customers' needs, they want to learn about customers' need and liking, as this is their first experience with e-commerce, so they want to learn a lot about technology point of view as well. Now, business stakeholders are dedicated and they have bandwidth to collaborate with the development team frequently. So after seeing all this point, Agile Mindset would be the good model, as Agile will allow them iteratively, allow them to tweak, allows the flexibility for change. Close collaboration with business stakeholders is also present, which will make Agile model successful, so Agile will be the good fit for this situation. Let's take another example. A decent sized company has a web-based product and there's a request from a user for a new feature. Building this feature is very costly and they're not really sure they wanna do it. They're not really sure this feature is gonna be used because only a few users have actually requested for it. So for this example, let's do an analysis to find which model should be used. Now, it's an unknown expected use. We are not aware of the exact number of people who are actually gonna use this. Unexpected user needs. We are not really aware if people really need this. So the model which is gonna fit into this is a lean startup concept. Here you can come up with some experiments to ensure that this is true. And once this is done, we can keep iterative and build right solutions. Let's take one more example. Founder of an existing successful company has a new disruptive idea that's untested. This has got an idea saying, let's build this and it looks good, but this is disruptive idea and doesn't really exist anymore. So founder would like to create a new product or company based on that disruptive idea. Now what's the analysis and recommendation to find the right model? It's an untested new idea since this is untested. So the idea has actually never been tested on the field. So it's also an unexpected user need. Now the people will like it or use this or not. In this scenario, lean startup would be the best fit to validate the idea and the need and then go from there. So this startup will be a really good example. So we have taken a few examples and these examples must have given you a fair idea on the analysis of the situation and recommendation of which would be a good model. All models are equally good and should be used as per the situation and as per your analysis. So you can try a lot more examples with this model analysis and get good with that, using real data, using real numbers, and figuring out your own way. Thanks a lot for following along in all the videos of this session. Please leave your questions and comments. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.